About eight years ago, my family and I took a trip down to Tombstone, Arizona, one of the more famous ghost towns in that area of the US. I was quite a bit into the paranormal at the time, so naturally was more than excited to stop by the haunted birdcage theatre. No, I didn't see anything at the time while taking the photos. However, about five minutes after taking that photo, my brother started freaking out about seeing a figure in the same area. It's neat that after looking through the photos, we had something to back his experience up. My favorite thing about the photos is that this isn't just some random black blob. This is an actual female figure. Even with the image quality being what it is, you can still zoom in and make out a surprising amount of detail. A necklace is easily visible. You can also make out bare shoulders and where the dress starts. Details of the face are harder to make out, but I almost want to say it looks like she's wearing a bird mask. The other photos pretty much debunk most possibilities of this being camera trickery especially when you look at the side by side comparison. But hey, if anyone can come up with a reasonable non paranormal explanation for this photo, I'd love to hear it. Needless to say, I've been pretty convinced of the paranormal ever since. I grew up in the South, tons and tons of beautiful places to see that haven't been taken over by concrete yet. It's nice, but along with that, it's pretty boring. Being a teenager and wanting to go out and have fun led to mostly improvising with your buddies and hoping something good would come out of the night. There wasn't really a local spot to go hang out, like a club or a cool bar, and the places that were closest to this were boring because you did them so many times. I'm sure if you've ever lived in a rural area, you can understand that feeling completely. Something that I found a ton of enjoyment in as a teenager was cruising around super late at night listening to music. I would fill my gas tank up, grab something to drink, a cigarillo, and I would just take off driving around until the sun came up. It was a way for me to just clear my mind and relax. Those country back roads were always fun to drive down at 2am and was also just the right amount of spooky. Well, one night, I absolutely got more than what I bargained for. I can't remember which month it was in exactly, but I knew for a fact that it was in the summertime because I was out of school and also remember it being a comfortable chill night. So if I had to guess, it must have been around July. I was cruising around like I always did and was completely worry free. I had music blaring and I was in my zone. I decided to head down to a park just out of boredom. This particular park is at the very end of a long stretch of desolate country road. But it was a really pretty drive because of that. When I say desolate country road, I don't mean that it's some dirt road that goes through the woods or anything crazy like that. It's a normal paved road, but there is really nothing on it after a certain point. The entire road takes about 20 minutes to drive down to get to the park. And after about 10 minutes into the drive, the houses start to get spread out further and further to becoming no houses and just roads leading into the park. I think a lot of the reason I liked this drive at night, it's because of how creepy it was. And I looked at it as some sort of adventure or whatever. The park isn't open for camping or anything. It's mostly just a lot of land with walking trails and biking trails set up through miles of woods. So obviously at around 3am in the morning, it's pretty dead. I made it there and just did a slow and normal little loop around the park. The night before it stormed very badly. So badly. In fact, I remember my parents and I had to take shelter because of the threat of a tornado touchdown. 
There ended up being no tornado, but the storms were pretty damn rough. Because of this, I came up on a fallen tree in the road that looped around to the exit of the park that must have happened because of the storm. It wasn't some massive tree or something, but I knew for a fact that there was no way I could have gotten over it in my car, obviously. It was pitch black everywhere besides the front of my car because of my headlights. And just because of that, I immediately ruled out backing up the entire way. I just drove where I entered the park. I knew that was super dangerous and there was no way. At this spot on the road, there was flat land on each side of me. I figured that would make most sense to just back up in the grass beside me just a little and then drive back the way I came. It was a long one way loop around the park, but I wasn't really worried about going out the wrong way since it was so late. So I started to back up off the road so that I could get my car turned around. All was good until I went to pull back up onto the road. I totally didn't take into account how wet the grass was and the amount of mud. My car went absolutely nowhere. My back tires were completely stuck and were spinning in place as I was trying to floor the gas pedal. I started to become pretty scared at this point. Not the most ideal situation to be in. I immediately take my cell phone out my pocket and saw that I had service, which was a huge relief. I called my parents and told them what happened and where I was. They were pretty pissed at me, but said that they will pay for a tow truck to come get me out. My parents both drove small four door sedans and they would have been zero help in this situation. I was about 45 minutes away from my house and the rest of most human civilization. So I realized that I would be stuck out there for at least an hour before someone was able to come and get me. It was a freaky feeling, but I tried getting it out of my head and just continued to listen to music and be on my phone in the car while I waited. Not really much more I could do. After I kind of calmed down from the initial anger I had, I started to check out my surroundings. I didn't even notice at first because of everything going on. But in front of my car's placement was a field that was full of the most amount of deer I think I've ever seen at once. There legitimately must have been at least 40 just walking around and eating grass. The field wasn't directly in front of my car. But if I was to get out and throw a rock in that direction, it would have been easy for me to be able to hit one of them. So I'd say around 30 yards away. This didn't really help with the creepy level going on. Looking out in the front of the car and seeing 80 eyes reflected staring back at you is a bit alarming, but I was relieved it was just a field of deer. I watched them for a little bit, but I was quickly over it and started to just browse through my social media apps while I waited. They seemed to have gotten over it quicker than I did because they all went back to walking around and eating once they figured out I wasn't going to do anything to them. I browsed my phone for about 15 minutes when I finally got a call from my parents, letting me know that a tow truck guy is on his way and about an hour and a half from my location. Still to this day, I remember hearing that and having the thought, you've got to be kidding me. I understood that me and only me was the reason I was in this situation. So I couldn't really be mad at anyone else, but that was very obviously not what I wanted to hear. I decided the smartest thing for me to do was to make sure all my doors were locked, lay back in my seat and take a nap to pass the time quickly. So that's what I did. I wake up 45 minutes later to the feeling of being watched. I'm not sure if anyone has ever experienced that feeling before, because I don't know how common it is. But there was a sixth sense alarm going off in my head, telling me that I needed to wake up. Waking up to that feeling in the situation I was in, and the surrounding I was in, is probably worst case scenario. 
I sit up and immediately check my surroundings and see nothing. I looked through my car very quickly for any sort of weapon and found a pocket knife. I was very scared, even though I heard and saw absolutely nothing. That feeling is terrifying. I was shocked to see that the field of deer in front of me was still full of deer. I don't know anything about the animal, but I guess I always just assumed they didn't hang around in the same place for too long. I called my parents back to see if they had any kind of update from the tow truck. I decided to not mention the feeling I was having because I didn't want them to worry more. Then I also knew that it was literally nothing more than a feeling I had and had nothing to back up why I was feeling that way other than just being spooked out in general. No update from the tow truck guy. So we assumed everything was still fine on his end. The call lasted just a few minutes because I felt like such a dweeb. They both had to wake up for work in a few hours and now have to spend another random hundred dollars on top of it all. And they were worried about me too. I could tell they were annoyed at the situation, but worried. I told them I'll make sure to tell them when the guy arrives and that I was sorry. We hung up and I looked up from the phone and immediately went from zero to a hundred in panic mode. The deer in front of me were all completely perked and staring in the same direction, right of them. Let me remind you that there are around 40 deer in this field. Every single one of them was stopped dead in their tracks, standing completely still looking at something. I put my high beams on and started waiting for absolutely anything to happen at all. Nothing. I tapped my horn real quick and they didn't even budge or look my way. They were all still completely glued to what was by them. The way the tree line was, I couldn't see that far over into the field. I knew they were looking into the woods by them, but where I was, I was only able to see them. I could hear my heartbeat. I grabbed that pocket knife and just waited for something to happen. I would say it was about a minute after I honked. Every single one of them in unison started to run in the opposite way. They were running at full speed and within 20 seconds, the field was devoid. I was petrified in fear. I knew that staying in my car is what would be the safest thing to do. But it's the worst feeling in the world when you feel like a sitting duck. My head was on a swivel. I was freaking out in every way possible. And I assumed that it was a bear or something. But it could have been absolutely anything. I was convinced at that point, it was the devil himself. I don't know what to do. I knew that the tow truck was close by but I had no idea where he was. I began to shake because of the nerves and just looked around to make sure nothing was with me and focusing on the field in front of me. I did this for what felt like an eternity, sitting in complete silence and darkness in the middle of nowhere, waiting for something to jump out and attack you. 15 of the longest minutes of my life go by and I start to see lights break through the tree line on the road. As it gets closer, I see it's the tow truck guy. The lights on his truck felt like it was Jesus coming from heaven to rescue me. He gets up to me and I jump out my car and immediately ask him if he has a gun on him. I told him very quickly what just happened and that something is definitely out here nearby. He let me know he had a shotgun in the truck and assured me that it was most likely a bear or bobcat. He gave me the whole, they're more scared of you than you are of them. The tree was small enough for him to sort of bulldoze it out the way. And then he attached my car to his and pulled me out of the spot. He was very nonchalant about what I had just experienced, but I was pretty badly shaken up from it. The whole time he was doing his thing, I had my eyes glued out in that field waiting for something. He was completely done in about 15 minutes 
and told me to follow his truck out of there onto the main road again. I got in my car and was ready more than anything to get the hell out of this park. We started to drive away from that spot. And I still had my head on a swivel, completely shaken. As we were driving away, I look in my rearview mirror. We were down the road, just a tiny bit, but I could still see the spot that I was stuck in. It was partially lit from the vehicle's lights and the moon. I watched in my rearview mirror as a man came out of the tree line behind where my car was and walk into the middle of the road and watched us drive away. My heart stopped beating. Legitimately, I lost my breath and my eyes started to get full of tears because of how absolutely scared I was in this moment. I couldn't see any sort of detail, like what he looked like, or even necessarily what he was wearing. To be honest, I didn't really care. The feeling that I felt driving away from that spot, knowing he was right there the whole time, watching me. As I was freaking out and looking around. Watching me as I was completely alone for the longest time maybe even coming right up to my window and watching me as I slept. That's a feeling. That's something I can't necessarily put into words. All these years later, and it still messes with me quite a bit. The entire time we were driving off, as as long as I could see him, he didn't move. Just watched us in the road. A million things went through my mind. I was scared there may have been multiple people up the road waiting for us. I was trying to figure out if I could start beating on my horn like crazy to get the tow truck guy to stop or not. I decided that all I wanted to do was to get out of there more than anything. And the second that we finally got out of the park and were able to go onto a two lane road again, I flew past the tow truck driver and did nothing below 70 miles an hour the entire way home. I flew through the stop signs and absolutely did not care. The only thing on my mind was making it home. I got home, ran inside, very quickly acknowledged my parents and said sorry and thank you and went to my room. I didn't get a single second of sleep for the rest of the night. I was searching for any sorts of records of things happening in that area, escaped convicts, similar stories and I came to the conclusion that the man was some sort of squatter or homeless. I read many things online about how common it is for homeless in rural areas to build shelters in the woods, which does make sense. But obviously, the unknown is the scariest part of it all. What if he wasn't homeless? What if he was going to hurt me? What if, what if? There are so many possibilities of what could have happened. But the outcome that did happen is what I am most grateful for. I never told my parents this story until many years after it happened, and I was already an adult and moved out. It freaked them the hell out too when I shared it. I never went back to that park, ever. Even though I no longer live by there, I still have no desire to go near there at all. I don't think I even could in broad daylight with a ton of people around. I also made the decision to stop doing these late night cruises. I did a few after that time with people, but even then I felt uncomfortable and on edge. So man in the woods, let's never meet again. The desert is a scary place for me now. It used to be a place filled with peace and serenity. But since living out there for almost 30 years, you see things. This occurrence took place in the high desert of California in the mid 90s. The whole town was once all military. There is a military plant there and a prison. The streets to this day consists of numbers and letters, for example, Avenue O and 178th Street. You always heard stories of people missing and underground tunnels. In fact, a friend of mine kept getting a draft coming in from his closet in his childhood home. After he grew up, 
He checked it out and found an opening to one of these such tunnels. He called me over to check it out, but after I got there and we went through the opening, I was too freaked out to go more than 10 feet in. When I turned around and told him, this might be how people disappear. You always saw things late at night off in the distance, far past the lights of the small town. Strange glowing lights that shot straight up, and things in the sky that you never spoke about. Life was pretty carefree back then. If you wanted to visit though, you would have to drive down long desert roads and sometimes end up coming home late at night in the pitch black because there were no street lights. I remember coming home late one night with my boyfriend at the time and another friend and we pulled over for some reason. Something compelled me to get out of the car and look to the stars. We were in the middle of nowhere but we could hear what sounded like machinery and muffled clanks from metal. We all started looking around, but didn't see anything. Just then, we felt a vibration under our feet. I crouched down on the street and put my ear to the ground. It was coming from under us. We all listened intently and heard far down voices, but couldn't make out what was being said. We all stood up and were discussing what it might have been when we saw a small red light on the horizon that was getting closer. We piled into the car and got out of there. We only shared this with a few friends and they had experienced the same thing. A year later, I told a friend that I had started a small business hauling, but there was a big job so I needed to borrow a trailer. He said he had a few so I could use one and that I should go back to his property to check it out. It was just starting to get dark when he pulled out his new toy. It was military grade night vision binoculars. He told me to wait until it got dark to leave because he wanted to show me something creepy. I was all in. Later, we walked towards the back of his property, looking out at nothing. No lights, no roads, nothing but the barren desert. He pointed the binoculars east, and oh my, there were people out there coming out of the ground and moving around. What the hell am I looking at? He told me his family called them ground dwellers, and they're located in various parts of the desert. It gave me the heebie-jeebies, and needless to say, I never went to his house after dark again. At one point, we were living in a mobile home park past Avenue F. There was a huge tree in my yard left by the former renter. The only way to get up into it was a hole that was cut into the floor with a door on it. Under that was a rope ladder. One night I was sitting on the porch drinking a cup of tea when I heard something move up in the treehouse and then a head popped up. It was a lady and her husband hiding. Clearly, I thought they were on drugs. I told them to come down from there, but they didn't want to. It wasn't until I threatened to call the authorities did they cautiously comply, looking all around, not wanting to be seen. By now, there's a small group of my friends and nosy neighbors gathering around, and I saw that she was terrified by something, so I asked them to come in. I made them something to eat and waited for her to calm down. She pulled out these papers. They were drawings and schematics. They looked like legal documents with government letterhead. Some of them had embossed seals and had smoke damage, even a few burnt around the edges. She told me that they were checking out this place off Barrel Springs Road. There were two or three cinder block structures there. I knew them well. A few years back, I happened upon that place and a black truck rushed down to greet me with guns drawn. She said the same thing happened to her, but she was in one of the structures. So she grabbed some of the things and her and her husband ran. I went over these pages and felt very uneasy reading them. Like this was stuff people get killed over if you got out. Stupidly, I said, why don't you just give them back? She said they had been running 
and everywhere they went, they saw a black car or van with government places showing up, just sitting there watching them. Well, I really didn't want to get too involved, especially after reading what I did. It wasn't too big for me, and I will take what I saw to the grave. So I packed them a lunch and told them they could sleep in the treehouse for the night. They did, but were gone early next morning. After that, we started seeing black vans parked on our lonely road facing the house. At one point, I even went up to one of them, but they took off as soon as I knocked on their blacked out driver's window. Lots of unexplained things happened out there in the desert. You don't see much of it now, I think because there are more lights and people, well-lit towns and camera phones pointing in every direction. There weren't cell phones to call for help back then. I remember one time a few years later. It was a fun day. Some friends and I were in this stupid little red car called a Yugo that seemed to be on its last legs most of the time. This is where my friend's uncle told him that there was a whole abandoned town far west of the Mugavi Desert, and that there were things just left there all over the place. We were so dumb. It took us a long time to get out there, and if you ask me to try and find it now, I don't know if I could. I wasn't driving, not that I would ever want to. Thinking we were lost a few times, we started seeing things. A carnival ticket booth on a trailer, broken tractors and furniture, little shacks here and there, and empty water bottles everywhere. There wasn't a store or place of business for many, many miles. I wondered how anyone could even survive in a place like this. And that's when we saw it. It was long, and looked like a single wide mobile home, if you could even call it a home. It was between 60 to 80 feet long, and it was raised with the siding going all the way to the ground. It looked like something from a horror movie. It had windows lined all the way around the front of the house with old frayed curtains still hanging up and blowing in the desert breeze. There were open sections of missing siding, exposing the darkness under the house. There were dusty cars with their front doors and trunks open, open cans and trash all over the place, and a small fire pit in the middle of all of this. His girlfriend and I saw people that seemed to not be wearing any clothes, but their bodies weren't like ours. They were inside that house and were watching us from the windows and from the open spaces under the house. They were following us, and we were driving the length of the house. As we slowly drove past, they went from window to window and space under the house to space. They were almost inhuman. They had big eyes and pale skin, far too pale for the desert. He pulled up next to the fire pit, and despite our protests to go, he turned off the car, and his girlfriend began to cry out that we had to leave now. He didn't see what we saw. Stop, babe, this stuff's cool, he said. Oh my gosh. I wanted to punch him in the face. We both kept looking at the people watching us while begging him to get back into the car. He picked up a long bone and was moving the soot around the fire pit. Hey, looks like someone cooked a dog. Just then he looked up at his girlfriend, leaned over to the driver's seat and grabbed his jacket and started to pull. And he finally saw what we were seeing and we said, oh shit. The thing under the house was swaying back and forth with his hands on both sides of the opening of the siding. He was staring at us almost with intent to lunge. He tried to start the car, but it failed. Thinking that this was the end, eaten in the desert, I started to beat on the back of his seat, screaming to start the car. And after three tries, we tore out of there in a cloud of dust. We pulled over far from that location and tried to compose ourselves. Never, ever would we return. I don't think ghost towns from this point on 
were a good idea. We didn't talk about what we saw after that. I think we were in disbelief that it even happened. There were so many things that occurred in the desert back in the day, too many to even come close to tell you. But I do believe that there are things we do not and maybe will never understand there. Also, just a tidbit of information. Rosmond way back in the day was a toxic dump site. That's why the houses were so cheap. You ask anyone now, and they won't know what you're talking about. This story dates back to July last year. It has enough weirdness that I find myself puzzling over exactly what happened quite regularly. My friends reactions sometimes make me wonder if this is just a big old self gaslighting experience. But yet, when I go over the details, there is enough deep weirdness that it only leaves two real options. I'll let you be the judge. A few years ago, my best friend Toby took a cross country grand position in Brisbane, a big tumulus thing for our group of friends. And amid the 3am power drunk confessionals and promises to not lose touch was a promise of the road trip. However, life found a way to make our drunk promises seem very disingenuous. And 18 months later, we'd hardly spoken barring a few crowded hours when he'd flown over for a family obligation. Eventually, the stars aligned mid July last year, and myself, Toby, and two other friends, Chris and Alec, were able to get the band back together. Queensland is a weird mix of tropical paradise, dead space, crocodiles, and genuine social backwardsness. Queensland is very, very much the Florida of Australia. Australia is huge. Not just huge, but vast and extremely empty. There is on average 3.1 people every square kilometer. And 90% of those people live in seven or eight major cities. If you think Reddit is an echo chamber, you've never had the pleasure of sinking a few cooling through these with a good old boys in outback Queensland. The Australian geography makes it really easy to get 100% removed from society and is something I often appreciate about the country. But the distance can be daunting at times because if things go wrong, nothing is close. Everything is amplified by distance. Our plan was to fly in, cram four dudes and two weeks worth of supplies into Toby's family sedan and straight book it 1600 kilometers north from Brisbane to Cairns. Being fiscally unendowed on a time schedule and outdoors inclined, we opted to keep driving most nights until we found an interesting slash free campsite to pitch up in, which was a complex process of cross reference and driver fatigue with the relative passive aggression of campsite comments with the wiki camps app worth every single penny if you ever travel in Australia. Generally speaking, we opted for road stops. But one night after staying too late in a particularly nice town, 1770, if anyone is playing at home, and reading a few particularly average reviews of the rest stop up the road, we decided to go off pissed and camp at an unmarked but seemingly well known campsite. Around 9pm, we took a left off the highway followed the wiki camps directions towards our campsite about 2.5 kilometers away from the Bruce Highway. Despite the remoteness, we found the campsite, a small 30 meter clearing between the banks of an apparent croc filled river and tall gum trees already occupied by a single caravan attached to a four wheel drive. Being quite familiar with camping, I felt a little awkward intruding on what I'm sure the caravan owners assumed was a private spot well after dark and made a mental note to smooth over any grievances with a cup of tea and a good day. Should we see the owners before we left? We started setting up the camp despite this frustratingly gravel thick soil. Have you ever tried beating a tent peg into a rock? We weren't being particularly loud, but must have attracted our neighbor's attention because he flung open the caravan door within two minutes of us arriving and started one of the weirdest conversations I have ever had. Expecting a gray nomad couple and a 
please keep it down. I was surprised by the 55-ish, bushy-bearded man that approached us. He seemed erratically drunk and asked us if we had a bong, which we did not. I offered him a beer and he asked where we were from. We mentioned Perth and he asks our names. We went around the group and we asked his. Oh, don't worry about that. And then he cleared his throat and made a joke. You know, I'm a gay prostitute. Mutual unexpected statement silence. Yeah, I'm great. But the other boys don't enjoy it as much. There was awkward laughter. It was also important to note that Chris and Alec were not particularly interested in this conversation, preoccupied with tents. Minimal attention was being paid, and Toby had made more an effort to engage, but was tending to his swag, and I was more or less solely engaged in the conversation. Despite his awful joke, which I talked up to different cultural sensitivities, I asked us if he minded us camping here. And what was he up to tonight? Oh no, I'm just watching the state of origin. Rugby, you know, I'm having trouble making friends. He pondered for 10 seconds or so and then followed up with, I used to have a good friend, but he was a crossdresser. So I had to take care of him. He said it so naturally that my general human statement interpreter thought it was an off joke and auto response had already kicked in by the time I realized what he had just said. Oh, how far is the river from here? Are we in range of any crocs? I asked before my brain could work out. Oh, why? Oh, only 150 meters that way with the shallow graves. You know, my friend knows where some shallow graves are up in Hervenly Bay. But yeah, you know, being out here alone, I wouldn't worry about the crocs. Do you promise not to kill me if I promise not to kill you? This was enough to trigger my dumb lizard brain and a very rapid understanding of danger kicked in. Oh, do you think Queensland will win the state of origin? It would be embarrassing to lose all three games. What's the score anyway? I asked in an attempt to show I'm less scared of the snake than it is of me. Good point. Just come knock if you want some bourbon boys, he said, as he walked the 10 meters to his caravan. I immediately turned to Toby and asked how much of that conversation he'd heard. He said not much, but enough to be a little shaken. And I asked if Toby had caught our bearded friend's name and he replied he had not. I immediately insisted to my friend that we take a walk to the river, despite Alec repeatedly saying, I'll be there in five, just let me finish my tent. I made it very clear that we needed to see that river right now. In the very remote dark, we huddled around a smartphone torch and I explained the conversation I had just had with our nameless gentleman. Alec and Chris again had only heard this guy being friendly and asked our names and certainly didn't understand why I was being so edgy. Despite my being fully aware that we were in an actual horror movie, I agreed to keep setting up and wait to see if anything happened. I immediately started scoping sizable rocks to use in a mano a mano fight to the end, should it come down to it. And 10 seconds after considering it, I asked Toby what we should do if our mate Mick Taylor happened to have a firearm. He paused very briefly and then very quietly and aggressively pronounced we should get the hell out of there. We packed up extremely rapidly, one eye on the caravan at all times. And despite protestations from Alec, we got the hell out of there. I still have no idea if this guy was trying to play a big old joke on four mid twenties guys, or if there was something more sinister behind it. You can get away with a lot more if no one's around. And there aren't a whole load of people looking in rural Queensland. Either way, I'd rather never meet again. This story happened when I was working the 150 mile line between Nashville and Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was working a local job on that run called the Coan Pusher, with the mountain grade starting at Coan, basically going all the way down to Chattanooga. It can be a very difficult stretch of railroad. 
I had the third shift on the cow and pusher. It was all I could hold even if I didn't enjoy working nights. We basically just sat in the shop and waited to be called to help tonnage trains get to Sherwood, Tennessee. Now, all I can say about Sherwood is picture the hills have eyes with banjos added in. On the night in question, it was around 1150pm when a heavy freight train stopped over at Sherwood and requested our help to get over the other side of the mountain. We climbed on the engines and got on our way. By the time we hit Koan and started curving up the foot of the mountain, we had no visibility of anything that wasn't illuminated by the locomotive light. We had a 30 minute ride ahead of us, along with a two mile long dark tunnel in our path. As the clock struck midnight, we were now in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods filled with wolves, rattlesnakes, and a few mountain folk. Most of the mountain folk are nice, but don't let the sun set your ass in those woods. About 10 minutes later, the north portal of the tunnel was in sight. A bridge hung over the entrance, a branch line that was taken up long ago crossed it, going to another part of the mountains. The bridge is still accessible by ATV. As I looked up, I saw a campfire and people. They all looked to be dressed darkly, perhaps even in mask, and all I could see were their white faces. As we started under the bridge, we heard a thud over our heads on the locomotive roof. We proceeded through the dark tunnel and slowed just out of the south portal as the conductor looked out the back door with his flashlight. He saw nothing. So we shrugged our shoulders and proceeded on the last 10 minutes on our waiting train. It was 1220am and we coupled on the rear of the train to push it from Sherwood as the engineer on the head end entered the south portal of the tunnel. He radioed back to me talking about figures standing over the tunnel entrance. However, no one was there as it came in my sight. As we exited the north portal, I looked to the best I could to see on my side of the tracks for whatever had hit our roof. I saw what looked like a black cloak fluttering in the wind as we passed, but couldn't really tell. As we entered Coan, we uncoupled on the fly, and the train continued to Nashville. We cruised on into our parking track and tied our engines down. As we got off, we had the feeling of being watched, but thought nothing as we parked our asses in the office chairs. We had no more work for the rest of our shift. We just talked and napped on and off until 3am. We never did shake the feeling of being watched. So we stepped outside as I put a pinch of dip in my lip and my conductor lit a cigarette. As we both laughed with each other, we noticed movement in the brush across the tracks. Now I must remind you that both my conductor and myself are big country boys who don't scare easy. We went over to investigate. We found three hooded men in the bushes with a huge spot of my tobacco. I asked them, what are you doing here? You understand you're trespassing on railroad property, right? The lead guy then spoke up in a demonic gravelly tone. We just want what's ours. As he said this, he motioned to the top of the locomotive. We looked to see a young man on the roof at the air horn. The young man was in nothing, not even underwear. And as we all looked at him, he bolted from the roof, climbed off and ran down the tracks. As this happened, the figures turned to chase. The lead guy then turns his head back towards us with glowing eyes that we could now see. 
he hustled, stared at us, and gave chase with his friends. We called the cops, and after hours of investigation, they found the man's underwear, with no traces of him or the cloaked individuals. We even took them up the mountains. Cops love free train rides. There was nothing. Now on occasion, we find dead animals by the shop door or locomotive, mutilated. I've even found one or two at my door at home. We still occasionally see that same fire on the bridge and get the feeling of being watched. But it's all gone by the time we return. I'm sure there's a cult somewhere on that mountain. My name is Dakota. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I've lived here all my life. I lived in this city, but I love the outdoors. During the summer, I'm always out hiking with my friends or fishing and camping. It's the thing to do. One of my best friends is called George. He would always talk to me about his father's property out in Duchesne. They had a few acres with trailers and RVs scattered around this little sandy cliffside that they lived next to that would actually drop you down into the canyon if you were brave enough to trek. He always would tell me about the freedom they had out there. You could go shooting wherever you wanted, even stand outside your own home butt ass naked, and no one would care because no one was around to see you. So George had invited me to go out to his father's property with him. And I was really excited to go, since I'd never been out towards Duchesne. The drive there from Salt Lake City is about an hour and a half to two hours, so it's a decent drive. When we arrived, I was pleasantly surprised to see his property was exactly as he explained it to me, and I loved it, and couldn't wait to get out and explore. I should remind you that his property was in the middle of nowhere, right off an old closed highway, and up a hill seriously in complete dry barren wilderness. There's cougars, bears, coyotes, rattlesnakes, and plenty of other animals that wouldn't mind making you their lunch. But even so, we carried protection, in order to ensure that nothing would happen. And that's another thing I need you to remember. We were armed to the teeth. George had recently brought an 18 inch sawed off 12 gauge double barreled shotgun, as well as an AK 47. His dad also owned a plethora of other weapons, which included a 30.30, 300 Ultra Mag, a gauge pump action, a 24 inch long double barrel, and plenty other handguns and revolvers. So there was no fear of anything happening on our trip. I think we were there for about three or four days, just having tons of fun, shooting and hunting rabbits and snakes. But the last night we were there, something really, and I mean really weird happened to us, and I still can't explain what it was. So that last night we were there, George, his father and I had been drinking and playing poker, and just having a fun time, when me and George decided to head up to a trailer where we could just hang out together and reminisce about the old days. We get to the trailer, and mind you, he has his AK, and I'm holding on to his sword off, and George decides to call his girlfriend back in Salt Lake to see how she's doing, and I didn't think anything of it at all. Until for some reason, while they were on the phone, they brought up the subject of a Wendigo. Us being out in the middle of nowhere and kind of getting creeped out, we told her to cut it out and quit trying to scare us, because we had this dumb belief that if you even mentioned a Wendigo, you would just be stalked by it, even though we knew that they were just myths. As George is speaking with his girlfriend on the phone, I'm laying on his sofa, right next to an open window on the right side of the trailer. And I swear to God, I see what looked like a person in the distance in the shrubbery and small trees, walking back and forth, almost trying to conceal themselves, but not doing a very good job. At this point, I told George what I'm seeing, and he starts to worry his girlfriend, because she's hearing us talk out loud about how we think we're being watched. George 
gets off the phone with his girlfriend, and just now reminds me that the trailer we were in did not have a lock on it. We have to get out of there. As I'm saying this, I noticed that the figure had gotten closer to the trailer, and I got a better look at who or what it was. One thing I saw that I literally have burnt into my brain was this thing's neck. It was too long to be a normal human. It stretched out and almost caused its head to bob around like a weight on top of a loose spring. Once I said this, he wasn't against leaving, but mentioned that we would have to go outside where this guy was if we wanted to get anywhere. So we made a very difficult choice. We only had a small electric lantern that would only illuminate about five or six feet in front of us, as we're standing back to back with our weapons in hand, literally ready to shoot anything that approaches us. We just stood back to back and circled around and around as we walked to the other trail that was about 50 yards away. And during that time we were hysterical. We didn't hear any footsteps following us as we made our way to the other trailer. This is when things get a bit messed up. When we finally got to the other one, the trailer that had a lock on it, we tried to be as silent as we could. We didn't even want to risk looking out the windows or moving the curtains to give away where we were. About an hour passes, and at this point we think we're in the clear, and the next thing we know, we are looking at the shadow of this thing standing directly in front of the moonlight, in front of the curtained window standing completely still. We are just about to defecate in our pants. Then as soon as it was there, it was gone. We didn't see it move, didn't hear it, just looked back, and it had vanished. The oddest thing happened after this though. I started to hear a pig, like it was in its pen waking up a storm. And I turned to George and asked him if he heard what I heard. And we just heard this weird disembodied voice come from outside the trailer. Oink. Not like a pig, but a person. This voice was sinister, like they wanted us to know that we were afraid, and it was said mockingly. I don't know if this was just some guy in a weird way trying to get around terrorizing random people's property. I have no clue, but I didn't want to go back and find out. If anyone has any information or could help me figure out what was happening, I would very much appreciate it. Till then, I'm trying not to think about it. I live in a very small town of about 100 people in rural New South Wales, Australia. This happened when my friends and I were 14. My town used to be a very close-knit farming community. But the shift to modern times and the massive drought of the 2000s led to most of the businesses to be closed and farmers to move away. The aging population slowly died, and their houses were filled with despicable types, drug dealers and addicts, thieves and dull bludgers. It's sad really, but even now there are still great people here. What I've always found creepy is even though a very small population and I've known just about everyone since before I can remember, there have always been people in the surrounding area that no one seems to know. Old loners mostly who keep to themselves, and no one ever sees them. On top of that, there have been several depraved people with interests in minors. There have also been numerous break-ins and attempted break-ins in our homes, not to mention that for long stretches of time, we've been without a police officer which means a 000 call would take an hour for help to arrive. It gets even creepier. The further the bush you go, I've heard of abandoned farmsteads where families have just vanished, with all their belongings including their cars left behind. There was even a multi-generational inbred family reminiscent of the Hills Have Eyes discovered a few years ago, though that was a few hundred miles from me. I grew up and went to primary school here, but we had to travel an hour to get to high school. It took quite a while for my closest childhood friends, Tim and I, to make new friends. After two years of high school, we invited three friends to come out to town to go camping. Tim's parents owned a small property where they kept sheepdogs and horses a few miles from the town. 
We camped for five days there in the school holidays. The first night, as what often happens, we sat around the campfire telling stories. I told the story of some of those creepy loners I mentioned earlier, a pair of brothers that lived a few miles up the road from where we were camping. They were rarely ever seen, with a reputation of being creepy hillbilly hicks. I told them the story of how one night they had tried to cripple my father over him, supposedly stealing their business. They ambushed him at the local Weybridge at night. My father managed to fight both of them off, and my cousin also had a run in with them by taking a shortcut across their field, only to hear a firearm shot in his direction. My cousin had lied to me before, so I wasn't sure if it was true, but I made out like it was and later embellished their reputation with the normal inbred cannibal type crap city folk expect. On the second night, we decided to go for a night walk. We were kids and enjoyed fantasy movies and games and had a bit of role playing fun. One of us was too scared to go out in the dark. So on our walk, we decided to play a prank on him. We started screaming and running back to camp saying he got Henry. It worked and our friend was scared. Zeb tried to climb an electric fence to escape. I, Henry, came back dirty and bloody, and we hid in a farmhouse until Tim ruined the prank by claiming he heard the brother skinned people, which caused us to burst out laughing. The next afternoon, we hiked up the nearest hill called Sims Gap Hill. It was a popular walk for Tim and I when we were kids. The fastest way to get to the hill was by taking the dirt road called the Stock Route, which ran parallel to the main tar road which led to the town. The two roads are connected by another called Sawmill Road, which was at the base of the hill. We walked down the stock route, and I pointed out the hillbilly brothers property as we went past it. All you can see from the road are piles of rusted old cars. We reached Sawmill Road and walked across the paddock to the hill and had an enjoyable time. We started climbing down the hill as it got late but underestimated the time it took to walk across the paddock to the road. By the time we reached the road, it was night. And of course, it happened to be pitch black. As we started walking down Sawmill Road to the stock route, a pair of massive bright headlights turned onto the road from behind us. Naturally, we got off the road, which meant disappearing into the thick patch of trees between the road and the brother's property. As the lights caught up to us, the vehicle started slowing. Up until then, we had thought it was a farmer's ute, but now we realized it was a very old, very loud tractor. Not wanting to be questioned by any meddling adult, I tried to encourage the guys to hide. The tractor slowed right down and flashed a spotlight into the trees and then sped away. The guys asked me who it was and I said I didn't know. As we continued walking slowly, we saw the tractor turn around the stock route and then into the brother's property. Now I was unnerved. The tractor came roaring down the fence line and I yelled at the guys to run. We ran until we came to a small, well hidden ditch, which we jumped in and lay very still. The tractor stopped right on us and they shined the spotlight over the trees. It didn't illuminate the ditch. Luckily, the driver stopped and got off the tractor, walked over to the fence, and I peered up and saw the silhouette of a dirty disheveled man with messy hair standing at the fence line looking around. In his hands was a rifle. In a nasally Aussie hillbilly voice, he yelled out, Where are you? We didn't dare move. I started thinking what we'd have to do if he climbed the fence and started coming our way. But he eventually turned around, got back on his tractor and left. It started with a groan and then rumbled down the other way. I got my friends up and we sprinted towards the stock route, ducking under branches and jumping over fallen trees. We hadn't quite hit it when the headlights were behind us again, roaring up Sawmill Road. We made it to the road and panicked. It was still two or three miles back to the camp and we wouldn't be able to outrun the tractor. On the other side of the stock route was a state forest with tens of miles of twisting dirt roads and motorbike trails and goat tracks. 
despite how dark it was, with the strong possibility of getting lost, we dove in there. We hid as he went past us again, finding a forest road which led back to the general direction of town. We followed it for a while, wondering if he had given up, and if it was safe to go back on the stock route. Then he was in front of us, blinding headlights roaring down the forest road. We jumped back in the trees and decided to run. We ran straight past him. Behind us, he turned back on the stock route and chased us again. He circled us four times with us hiding, then running, then hiding, then running. When we had gone far enough, that we thought we were close enough to the camp, we ran through the woods and jumped back on the stock route to be met by headlights. Tim's mother had come looking for us after finding our camp empty. She'd finally found us and we were still a mile or so from camp. We quickly piled in and she drove us back. We told her what happened, but she and my parents just said they're weird people and to stay away from them in future. I'm a 20 year old female and I live in a very religious state and grew up in a very religious household. But I myself have never been religious nor spiritual. I'm an atheist, horror enthusiast, and the paranormal has just never been something that scared me, but always something that's interested me. My hood rap friends and I love to go and explore abandoned towns and buildings. I've been doing this since I was 16 and never had any scary encounters other than some rats and raccoons. This past summer, my friend suggested we go visit one of our state's oldest cemeteries that's about 30 minutes up a canyon I live right next to. As we entered the tiny town and maybe 30 very old houses, he took me down a separate street to show me an old abandoned schoolhouse. Normally we would get out and go explore, but it was the middle of the day and raining heavily. So we just passed by. There's a plaque on the top of the school that reads 1904 and is surrounded by other very old abandoned cabins. All of the entryways were boarded up and it appeared that there was no way in. It was an absolutely beautiful building and I was very intrigued. The next night, I decided to go back up there with another friend of mine. We both get off work super late so we didn't even end up heading up there until about 1.30 a.m. The drive up the canyon was fine. We listened to music and joked the entire time. But the second we turned onto the road leading us to the small ghost town, I felt sick to my stomach. I honestly can't even explain the exact feeling that I felt, other than pure terror and dread. I kept trying to write it off as general anxiety from driving so far in the dark. But as we got closer to school, the worse the feeling became. As we approached the building, I nervously suggested that we just drive around and see the building 360. As we did, I looked down at one of the doors that were completely boarded off the night before, and one door was open. Mind you, it had been raining for the past 48 hours. There was no way that someone would have went down there and opened that door. We pulled up down the street of the school next to one of the much older, very abandoned cabins. Reluctantly, I got out the car and locked the door. I thought that maybe I was overreacting and that I just needed to take a Xanax or something and calm down. But when I looked at my friend, I could tell he was very uneasy as well. Very out of character for the both of us. We started walking up the street towards the schoolhouse. The feeling in my stomach got worse. And before I knew it, we were standing on the road in front of the schoolhouse. I looked down at my feet, about to step onto the grass. Every single fiber in my body was telling me not to step into the property. I'd never felt this feeling this strong before. I've never been this scared in my life. I wrapped my arm around my friends and forced myself to step onto the grass, even though I knew I shouldn't have. I started to walk around outside the building, 
just to get a closer look of the outside. We're about 15 steps in when we come around the side of the building to a ton of trees. We kept walking. Before I could even open my mouth to express how fearful I was, my eyes welled up with tears. And at the same time, we both stopped walking. Neither of us could physically take another step, no matter how hard either of us tried. We both looked at each other and without saying a single word bolted back to my car. The ride home, we both came out clean and told each other how scared we were. My friend got really quiet and said, I don't believe in the paranormal. But when we first drove around the school, I looked up and saw this girl staring at me from one of the windows. The scary thing is about how this isn't just the fact that he saw this. There's little to no information about this town whatsoever. But the one only thing I found on the school were two separate Facebook posts. One saying, I wanted to go in and explore this building. But as I drove towards it, I got such a bad feeling I had to turn around and leave. And the other, I felt like I was being watched the entire time I lived across the street. One day I opened my window to find a little girl staring at me from one of the windows in the school. The rest of the night, I was too scared to sleep. I ended up calling my friend back over and we just sat on the couch in my living room and watched Disney films to make us feel better. But in the days passing, I couldn't help but feel like I wasn't alone. I kept having super strange and vivid dreams. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping in my room anymore. Fast forward two weeks. That weekend was my friend's birthday. So we'd been drinking for the past two days at an Airbnb. My liver loves me and I know it. One of my friends and I went back to my house to grab a few things and I had a shower while we were there. He was super tired and still a little intoxicated. And I told him he could lay down on the couch in my room and take a nap while I showered. After I had showered, I got dressed and walked back into my room. And I'll never forget this. My friend, mind you, was half drunk and half asleep, looks up at me and says, Who's the guy in your closet? It didn't really register to me at first. So I laughed and replied, There's no one in my closet. He looks at me very seriously and says, No, there's a man standing in your closet. He then woke up fully and explained that he was having a strange dream. But then it clicked. I felt the overwhelming sense of dread flow over me again. I had brought something back with me. I ended up begging my mother to have a priest come bless our home. Again, very out of character for me. And after the blessing, I immediately felt comfortable and happy in my home again. But I think that's more of a mental thing for me. Just being raised in a strict religious household. Because I'm still definitely not religious. I still don't know what to make of this experience. I don't know what I believe anymore. But I'm convinced that there was something watching over me that night when I went to the schoolhouse because I had a feeling that if I'd actually have gone in, it would have gotten a lot worse. This happened about 26 years ago. My friend Jack and I were driving an RV, pulling an old truck bed conversion trailer to Yucca Valley. He made a deal with a friend of ours to trade his RV for a running truck. We were driving on old highway 247, where there was nothing, just flat sand and an occasional rock formation. I remember we passed a rolling sand hill overlooking winding roads of nothing, and it was dark. I was laying on the side couch taking a nap while he called out for me to come up front and look at what he was seeing. They looked like lit balls of red fire darting past each other, going up and down about a mile ahead of us, and they seemed to be coming in our direction. As they got closer, we noticed that about four of them bunched together making one. 
Then four more joined them. Jack slowed down, and we were hoping they would go away, but they didn't. I opened the window, but we never heard a sound, and they just seemed to hover. Jack thought screw it, and started driving faster. That's when they all dispersed and flew towards this rock hill, and Jack floored it. We were all freaked out. As we were driving, we heard a bang from the back of the RV. So we ran back there trying to keep our balance because Jack was driving like a bat out of hell. And when I looked out the back window, I saw the trailer with something sparkling in the middle of it. I turned my head to tell him. But by the time I turned back, there were flames right where the sparks were. At the time the red lights were gone, just gone. Jack pulled over grabbed the small fire extinguisher by the stove. And we stood by the door. But we were too scared to go outside. With a few exhales, he puffed up his chest, swung open the door and ran out the trailer. I had a big flashlight. And I trailed behind him. The flames were getting pretty big, lighting up the desert around us. And it took a while to put it out. As we were looking above and around us. Jack jumped in the trailer to see what had caught fire. But all he found was shard of pointed metallic pieces strewn around in a dent in the bottom of the trailer bed. I jumped at the trailer because I didn't want to be standing on the ground alone. Just then we heard something about 40 feet behind us on the passenger side. I shined my light, but we didn't see anything. It was quiet, not a car or light in sight. We heard it again. It sounded like gravel, like when you scrape your shoe on dry dirt, but it was closer. Jack thought he saw something. So he took the flashlight. I of course was holding on to him so close, I could feel his heart thump through his ribs. He turned the light on where we heard the noise. And it looked like around five piles of sand, like little mounds in a row. Then the noise stopped. We started to jump out the trailer. And we heard it again. Jack beamed the light and caught the flash of some reflective diamond shaped eyes that quickly disappeared. Then those sandy dirt mounds began moving towards us at the same time as if something small was pushing them from behind. Jack grabbed me. We jumped and run towards the RV doors and I don't think either of us had ever run that fast before. He put the RV in drive and we sped off. We heard things hitting the back like rocks being thrown, but we didn't falter. We were constantly looking around and I stayed right next to him. By the time we got to a small town, the RV was sputtering. Jack didn't understand why. It was in perfect shape before we left. So we pulled over to check the engine. And under a street light, he took a walk around and saw that the hot tailplate had been curled up like folded up facing the back of the bumper. When he looked up, he saw all of the back window screens were shredded, and the rubber around the glass was hanging. He took some tools and some gloves and straightened the pipe. And we drove a bit longer to our friend's house. We told our friend what happened, but he didn't believe us. The next day when we woke up, our friend came in asking what the hell we did to the RV. So when we looked at it, it looked like the glass was etched with scratches up where the screens were shredded. We had no explanation as to what could have cut glass like that. And there were dents on the top and the back. In one spot on the side, there was what looked like an impression of five fingers with nail holes at the end of them and a wide thumb. Needless to say, Jack had to pay our friend for the damage to the RV. And we took his new truck and drove the long way back home. And we never spoke about it to anyone again. He kept a few of those metallic shards. He said that when he held them, it felt soft. But when he accidentally dropped it, it turned sharp and hard again. He told me that he had to get rid of them. Because the more he handled them, the more he noticed his hands would start to blister. And he didn't want his kids to get a hold of it. I kick myself now. Because if I had known back then it was so significant, I would have asked him to let me keep them. 
Five years ago, it was daytime, and I was driving with my son in my small truck. We were following my ex in his car, and we ended up in that same spot. It didn't dawn on me that we were going that way. I started to hyperventilate, and my son had to calm me down. You see, it was times like this that really made me hate the desert. A few years back, my older sister and I decided we wanted to go for a walk in a nearby park. It was early summer, and we had decided that we wanted to get healthy and eat better, which never happened, by the way. So we decided that walking would be a good way to introduce any sort of exercise to our lives. A little background info on this park and the surrounding area. We lived in a town where almost everything was named after Native American slash First Nation tribes and names. Our local school district was a Native American name. Our roads and our parks. This park in particular seemed to have many rumors that it was an old burial ground. But I thought that's nonsense and something that just dumb kids like to tell each other during sleepovers. The park is made up of cleared hills with a small paved path, kind of meandering through it. If you follow the path all the way back, you have the option to stay on the pavement and return to the beginning, or to go off onto a separate unpaved path into a small forest. We have felt like we hadn't burnt enough calories yet, and decided to keep walking deeper in. After walking for about five minutes, we came to a small clearing that had six distinct paths branching off. The clearing had a sign claiming that all the paths loop back around and a few facts about the park. We decided to go through one and that we'd see how we felt once we returned to the clearing. When we had returned, we decided that we were probably sweaty enough and that we could go home to make lunch. We had gone back down the path where we were sure it led to the front of the park, all the while talking about silly stuff that the two of us had gotten up to in the past few days. After walking for a little bit, we joked that it always felt longer after you decided you wanted to walk home. And then, seemingly like magic, the path we went down had led us back to the clearing. We looked at each other, both saying it was weird, and then laughed it off as us not being the most trustworthy with directions. We decided to make sure this time that the path we went down was the same path the sign was facing, seeing as it greeted us when we first arrived the clearing. I was sure we had done that the first time round, but wasn't 100% sure. However, when we did that, it had led us back around again to the same clearing. We decided to go down a different path, the only one directly to the right of the path we had taken before. Maybe we just didn't realize that the sign wasn't directly in front of the path. Still, we were led back to the clearing. We decided to make a system and to always go right of the path we had taken so that we didn't lose track. I remember us making jokes about how it would be the two of us to die in the woods that's only a mile away from home, or how the Blair Witch is probably mad at us, and that if we saw a pile of rocks, not to mess with them. We were very lighthearted throughout the entire thing. However, in the back of my mind, something wasn't right. The more and more we walked, the more I felt like something was watching us. I couldn't express it to my sister, for fear of her making fun of me. Or worse, she's saying she felt the same way. And it wasn't the type of watching as though we were being hunted or stalked. It was like whatever was watching us was finding humor in us being lost. It wasn't outright threatening, but it gave a very uneasy feeling. When we had made it to the sixth and final path, we laughed at our luck, at it being the last path to choose. We talked about maybe going swimming later on. We were both now quite sweaty. However, when the path ended, it didn't take us back to the front of the path. It was the same exact clearing we had been stuck in for the past few hours. I didn't know what to think. Maybe our system was flawed, 
and we had to think of a new way to make sure we weren't taking the same path over and over. As we both stood there in silence, partially from being dumbfounded and partially from being out of breath, I swore I heard something chuckle behind us in the trees. It could have been my imagination, or it could have been an animal. But all I remember is saying, screw this, and making a beeline into the woods. My sister began asking me what I was doing and following me. And I explained that if we just walked straight and didn't turn, we would make it out. She agreed, and didn't seem to object to trampling through high grass thorns and trees, which made me feel like she had felt strange about the situation too. When we finally saw a break in the trees, we sighed with relief. We walked right out of the woods into the backyard of someone's house in a nearby housing development, walked around the front and saw an older lady sitting on her front porch drinking lemonade. She asked us where we came from and we said we got lost in the woods and asked where we were. She didn't seem shocked in the slightest. Oh yeah, those woods will do that to you. She offered us some lemonade and a ride back to our car. We took the lemonade but decided to go back to the car walking. We were a long way away, but we declined as it would be fine as long as we stuck to the roads. Anyway, no one believes me when I say how creeped out I was. I know that feeling disappeared as soon as we left the woods. All I know was whatever was in those woods wasn't happy that my sister and I were there. And I'm not going back to see what will happen again. So my cousin and I thought it would be a good idea to visit a ghost town that was located nearby. We had heard stories from other relatives saying they saw a woman and a daughter in a dress standing or walking by the side of the road. Whenever they'd pass her, their cell phones would either die or completely lose signal. And one of my cousins said his car stopped working as soon as he passed the woman. Seven of us got into a big van and went to the ghost town to see if all the paranormal activity was true. We were talking and laughing in the van, making fun of the people who did get scared of the town and that they were just probably imagining things. None of us had been to a ghost town before and we didn't know when we would reach it. As we crossed a bridge that led to the ghost town, the scenery completely changed. A huge fog appeared out of nowhere and covered the whole town and bridge. The laughter in the van died and it was dead quiet because we knew we had entered the ghost town area. We parked the van on a dirt road that was a little further than the entrance to the ghost town. We turned off the car and closed all the windows and just sat there looking into the dark empty houses. It felt as if the houses were full of ghosts, just looking at the van, as if we had invaded their space. The atmosphere was so tense, and after five minutes of just sitting there in the dark, the driver of the van suddenly turned the car on and drove out. We all wondered why he'd left so suddenly, and we asked him but we wouldn't answer us. He parked at a nearby gas station, and his face was extremely pale. He finally started talking, and said he saw a little girl walking behind one of the houses, coming towards the van. He was so scared, you could see him trembling. He ran inside the gas station, and the cashier saw his pale face, and surprisingly, he just asked the driver if we'd just come back from the ghost town. We told the cashier that we did, and that our driver supposedly saw a little ghost girl. The cashier told us that he had passed by the town a few times, and saw the same thing. He advised us that if we wanted to experience something paranormal, we should wash the car down with those little window wash things that they have at gas stations. We thought this was a good idea, so we all went out and washed the car, we washed the top of the car, the sides, the doors and the windows and all the mirrors, washed all the windows inside the car and we took paper towels and completely dried the car inside and out. We were at the gas station parking lot for a good 10 minutes, 
talking to see if we were going to go back to the ghost town or just go home. We agreed to switch drivers and head back. We went back onto the dirt road and traveled into the center of town. We sat in the van for 15 minutes, just looking out for signs of a girl or signs of activity in the houses. I can't explain how tense the atmosphere was. Seven of us, all aged 17 plus in a van, and we had to hold hands. It was weird, but everyone was so scared we couldn't help it. After 20 minutes in the center of the town, I had begun to see a figure in the distance. It seemed like the little girl everyone was talking about, but something was odd. It didn't look like the girl was walking. She was making these odd movements as if she was limping. I told everyone to look into the distance, and everyone said they saw her also. We watched, and after three to five seconds, the figure looked as if she were getting up. We realized she was crawling and had begun to stand up. Right when she stood up, the figure disappeared into the blackness, and a loud bang hit the driver's side. The gravel beneath the van made sounds as if someone was crawling under the car, and three very distinct thumping noises came from under the car. The thumping was directly below my feet, and I could feel something hitting the car. Something also stepped onto the back bumper of the van, and a small thump could be heard hitting the back window. I made the decision that we should leave immediately, and so we did. We got to the gas station, everyone got out of the car, and we all saw it. On the driver's side mirror was a large fresh handprint. We were all freaked out. I made my way to the back of the car, and there was a little footprint on the back bumper, along with a set of handprints and fingerprints on the back window. But they just wouldn't come off the car. We sat at the gas station for 30 minutes after that, just freaking out, and the prints wouldn't dry. When you touched the prints, they wouldn't feel wet, but they'd look as if they were. Everyone was scared to go back in the van, but we eventually did, and we made sure not to drive the van directly to someone's house, because in our culture, something could have clung onto the van and tried to follow us home. So we went to a nearby Walmart. We stayed in the store for 45 minutes, came out, the prints were still there. So we had to call someone to get us and left the van in the parking lot until the next day. The prints eventually disappeared, and we took the van back to my cousin's house. We are never going to a ghost town again. This story happened to my sister-in-law four years ago. They are uber religious, and the state of her mental stability, on top of a finger found and a police follow-up, makes this story 100% true and searchable. Last July, my sister-in-law Jackie was going back to Boise to visit for the weekend. Her husband lives in Provo and is going to law school there, as he's just graduated from a BYU chapter somewhere in southern Idaho. I'm not from Idaho, and I'm not Mormon, so I don't remember where it's located. Anyway, Jackie decided to drive from Provo, Utah, and head up to BYU to say hello to her friends just before coming back to Boise. The route she was on was I-15, which forks off into I-84 up to Boise. After you pass through Salt Lake City, the route becomes lost in a plain rolling flat of miscellaneous desert dotted by farmland here and there. Jackie left Provo, Utah in the evening, as she planned on making dinner for her husband before her departure. She ended up leaving around 11pm, and given the late time, she decided to forego visiting her friends at the BYU chapter, and headed along I-84 to come straight to Boise. 
She was in between Tremonton, Utah, and Burley, Idaho, in the literal middle of nowhere, where she drove up to what looked like a body lying in the road. The location is so desolate, there are no radio channels, cell phone services, or lights to be seen for hours. This 24 year old girl was in the middle of the desert in a green Dodge car that already had enough problems. So it's a miracle she made it home to us without issue to begin with. She arrived at my wife's parents house. But that was just the beginning of the story really. Here is her account of what led to these events. At 2am she said she saw something lying on the road in the distance. As she approached it, she could see it was a body lifeless in the middle of nowhere. It stretched across both lanes, and she could not simply pass without running it over. Cautiously, she came to a stop and made sure she parked about 15 yards away and stopped. She opened the door and yelled, Are you all right? But no response could be heard. With the car lights broadcasting brightly on the body in the road, she got out of her car and slowly walked towards the person. As she got about 10 feet from the body in the road, she could see it was a dummy, fully dressed in human clothes just lying there. Terrified, she sprinted back to her car, slammed on the door, and sped over the dummy. We received the cell phone call from her around Mountain Home, 45 minutes away from Boise. She was shaken and terribly scared, claiming she could hear footsteps chasing her to her car before she got in and drove off. We wrote it off as a freak accident, as we were all asleep and sounded too bizarre to worry of anything. As she pulled into the subdivision, she called us once again to help her unload the car and probably console given the bizarre experience. I opened the garage door and stood in the driveway with my wife waiting for her to pull in. She came racing into the driveway and jumped out of the car. And this is where I lost it. As she opened the car door, a finger fell out. She had not stopped and drove straight to us after she came across the dummy. The person who had placed the dummy had chased her back to her car. And as she slammed the door and sped off, the person had reached out, losing a finger in the slammed door. We immediately called the police in the area where she said she stopped at. The cops did a survey of all the hospitals in the area for a man missing a finger, and they found an exact match of his description. He was still in the hospital as he was arrested. The police did not give any details into the man's past or who he was just simply told us to not worry about him as he'd been arrested. I'm sure it's an anticlimactic ending to a terrifying scenario. But I will never forget the feeling that came over me when the finger fell out of her car door. I always drive with a firearm in my vehicle now. Anytime I need to travel. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45 mile three night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc. and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream in the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The streams, as we found out, was a cave spring 
pouring out blue freezing cold water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide, and so deep, the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine. Ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired, and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire, and enjoyed the stars through the canopy of leaves for a while before everyone went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5am I woke up with a huge urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway open, and I had just popped my head out, when I heard a loud and terrible roar slash scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent, and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to the left, near the dwindling fire. It was high pitched, but not like an owl's screech, though I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small dry cave opening maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends heard the terrible scream, but no one had, and we pressed on down the green river. The third night at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore, and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go further down the river, and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field, a landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs, again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for 20 to 30 minutes. I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others were most likely as well. Suddenly my dream was interrupted, by what sounded like a booming loud mechanical wooden beast. I awoke, and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I've ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wooden building. And then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted, and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash, and yelling in confusion at each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents and no one was particularly willing to shine a flashlight towards the woods. Eventually, we all decided it was just a falling tree, and went back to sleep. The next morning I thought about it a bit more. It didn't sound like just a tree falling. I must stress, it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obviously fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. 
So he packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to head home. My friends and I talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a few years later, and nothing out of the ordinary occurred. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. This experience has bothered me for many years because I honestly don't know what to make of it. It has become one of those stories I tell around campfires, but this actually happened, and it still freaks me out when I think of it too much. I grew up on the east coast of Australia, and my family lived on a small country town on the edge of the rainforest. When I was 14, we rented a nice house on a few acres up a steep hill that ended in a cul-de-sac. The house was relatively nice, and sometimes I would go exploring the fire trails in the national forest behind us. I never found or saw anything weird. I don't even remember seeing any animals there either for some reason. Anyway, there was a deep, heavily forested gully with a small creek on the north side of the house that I never explored. Because one night, when I was home by myself, I heard something really weird. It sounded like screaming, but it was a decent distance from our house, and it echoed through the gully. There were no other properties or houses between me and where the screaming seemed to be coming from, so I had no idea what was going on. It was eerie. I listened to it in the dark for a while, and then I decided to go inside and lock all the doors. I didn't tell anyone about this, and probably would have forgotten about it, if it hadn't reoccurred several years later. By the time I was 17, we had brought a property and built a house down in the valley across the creek, not very far from where we were renting a few years prior. It was a beautiful property that was skirted by a nice little creek with thick rainforest on three sides. I had kept up my habit of exploring the surrounding areas on foot, and in my 4WD, I knew it like the back of my hand. We had a large circular driveway that came down to the house, wrapped around a large beech tree, and connected back up with the road at the top of the property. The east side of the driveway had heavy bushland, and one night, or early morning around 2am, I was coming home from my girlfriend's house, and my parents had left the front porch light on for me. I would always round the driveway and park the car on the east side incline, besides the bushland as I was locking the door to the 4WD. Just as I removed the key from the door, I heard it again, in the bushland, maybe 20 to 30 meters in front of me. But the bush was so thick, I couldn't have even seen a meter into the scrub. The light from the porch just lit up a dark wall of vegetation. It was in that moment I realized that every horrific scream I had heard prior to that moment in my life was not totally real. This one was different. It was real. And the difference chilled me to the bone. This person, it sounded like a woman, was being hurt brutally, and seemed as though their lungs would turn inside out from the agony. It sounded like they were trying to cry for help, but were in too much pain to make out any definite words. I stood there in shock for a moment, as I realized this scream was the same one I had heard years before, but this time closer. I went inside and woke up my parents and we all stood on the front porch and listened for a few brief moments while we tried to decide what to do. My dad and I decided to investigate and my mum called the police, who would have been useless anyway because we were so far out in the middle of nowhere. The screaming stopped, but we knew exactly where it was coming from. I grabbed a large cane knife, the best weapon I had in a country that outlaws firearms, and my father grabbed our spotlight. We got into the 4WD and drove around the bushland shining the spotlight in the area where we were sure the noise had been coming from. There was nothing. The police never came. But we drove around for about an hour, thinking maybe the source of the noise could have moved. But the scrub in that area was so thick, they wouldn't have been able to move very fast except on the fire trails we were using and we covered those extensively in a short period of time on the 4WD. 
The next day, I fully expected there to be a news report of a grisly death in our area, which would have been very uncharacteristic of our lazy little town. I thought there was no way of whatever was making that noise would have been able to not leave a huge mess for someone to find, but there was nothing. I told a few people about this experience, but Australians are no nonsense kind of people and don't put much stock in the supernatural. So everyone thought it was just wild pigs or an owl. I knew it wasn't either of those. My parents and I knew what we heard and we were sure it was human. One person was convinced that it was koalas mating. And when I insisted that this noise was human, the person said, Oh yeah, that's what everyone who hears it thinks. So I thought that might be a possible explanation, but only for my own sanity. As far as I know, the noise was never heard again. And a few years later, my parents and brother moved out of state. And I was living in the US for university and was sharing this experience with some kind of friends late one night. And the point that koalas mating was kind of a funny punchline. Except this time, one of my friends, who was obviously interested in the relations of marsupials said, have you ever looked up on YouTube to see if the sounds match up? I hadn't. So we spent a bit of time looking up videos of koalas mating. There were quite a few, and not one video sounded close to what we heard. So back to square one, with no explanation. Anyone have any idea what this could possibly be? A few years back, my girlfriend at the time and I were on a week long motorcycle trip during the summer, hotel hopping. We stopped in a major ski resort town, which is a complete ghost town during its off season for one of our stays, because close by there were multiple hiking attractions, one of them being a major ski resort itself. During the summer, you can ride the lift to the top of the mountain and from there supposedly take a 20 minute hike that overlooks the entire valley. We never got there. We arrive at this practically abandoned looking ski lodge, maybe had six cars in the parking lot if that, and no one was there to greet us as we walked in. We kind of aimlessly walked around the lodge and finally hear someone talking outside the chairlift. I approached the guy and ask about this hike that was offered. He was a seemingly nice man, told us the directions once at the top to walk straight back where you get off at and there's a trail that bends to the left and follow it for 15 to 20 minutes. It's an easy walk and you see the whole valley at an overlook at the end. I gave him the $10 or whatever the cost was to ride the lift. And this is where it gets creepy. As we get to the top, the guy manning the console steps out and gives us a friendly wave, kind of a young hefty guy. He stops the lift and I immediately notice he must have had some severe social anxiety or was very intimidated by me. As I'm six foot two, 250 pound, tattooed and sleeveless wearing my leather riding vest, I'm used to people avoiding interactions with me. After stopping the chairlift, the guy turns back to me and just loses all color in his face like he's looking at the devil himself. He's so nervous he could hardly open the safety bar. So I pop it off and we hop off. I ask him about the trail and he manages to squeak out over there. He points directly in front of us and then he giggles. He giggled like a kid sneaking candy in the backseat of a car. As weird as it was, I took it as nervous laughter and out of curiosity for his instant change of personality. I drag my feet around the lift house and take in the view for a while trying to talk to this guy. I ask him a few questions just being friendly to show him that I mean him no harm, but he never bites for conversation and shoots back quick short answers. We go onto the trail, hike for almost an hour never seeing anything but woods, and we never made it to the outlook, but came to a clearing in a field surrounded with more trees and no more trail. Total bad vibe. We almost jogged back the way we came. 
We came out of the woods, and the same guy from earlier acts completely shocked. We came back, almost like we weren't supposed to return. He asked us a bunch of questions about the trail, all while lightly giggling after each sentence. Then it seemed as if he was going to be in some sort of trouble, and hurried us into the chairlift back down the mountain. I'm an avid hiker. This trail only has one entrance and one exit, and we walked it from end to end. And Giggle Monster seemed surprised to hear we came back to a clearing like he's never known about it. The guys at the bottom of the mountain acted just as surprised. Maybe the body van was running late. I don't know. But that place had a wrong turn vibe all over it. Last year, I moved to rural Australia from the city to do some farm work with my boyfriend. He's from the UK, and to allow a second year visa, he needed to complete eighty-eight days on a farm. So I quit my job and went with him. We stayed in a working hostel, and people worked in farms all around the area. We lived slightly out of town, close to the highway, and about fifteen minutes from the beach. My boyfriend managed to get a job before I did, which meant a lot of boring days by myself at the hostel. It was early in the season, so there weren't many backpackers yet. Anyway, one of the boring days, I decided to maybe go to the beach, so I drove into town. The town is surrounded by three beaches, like a square on the edge of the sea, if that makes sense. One of the beaches was a bit further away, and I hadn't been that many times, so I thought I'd check out the other one instead. It was the middle of the day, and this is a small town, and there's no one else around. I pulled in the car park, and as I did, I noticed another car pull onto the car park too. It was a tradesman work van with a company logo on the side. For some reason, I didn't get out of the car right away. I just had a funny feeling. I look over into the van, about two car spaces distance between ours, and the guy looks at me and stares. He was an older man, I'd say mid forties, and had a very blank expression. The feeling of uneasiness I messaged my boyfriend, telling him I was at the beach just in case. While I'm doing this, Van Guy jumps out of his car and walks in front of my car along the path to the entry of the beach and heads down it. The path down to the beach is fenced. To protect the sand dunes, so there's only one way in and out the beach area. I remember thinking it was weird he was walking down on the beach, as he was in jeans and a button-down shirt, and black shiny business shoes. Strange attire for a sandy beach in Australia in 35 degree heat. I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling, but I also could just be thinking the worst of this situation. Just to be safe, I thought I'd drive. To one of the other beaches on the other side of town, just to be sure. By this time, Van Guy is out of sight, and presumably down on the other beach. So I pull out the car park and drive over to one of the other beaches. Now I have to explain the layout to give a little perspective. This other beach is on the complete other side of town, not on a main road, and you really wouldn't want to head down there without living nearby or heading to the beach. The entrance to the car park is a small one-way road that is like an L shape with cars parked along it, and then an exit at the end. It's a small car park with a street just over the other side, with only a few houses on it. So I pull into the empty car park, park my car in the first space, grab my beach bag, and as I'm about to get out the car, I see a van in my rearview mirror. It pulls over quickly across from the street from the entrance to the car park. This time he doesn't get out. At this point, I was too freaked out to get out the car. It just all seemed too weird, so I quickly drove home and stayed inside the rest of the day. I just couldn't shake that weird feeling. A lot of strange things happened in that town. It was like a pass-by town. People travelled through a lot to get to major cities. Yeah, this encounter was strange though. I never saw the man or his van again, but I didn't venture out on my own after that. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked down on the beach path. Was he waiting for me? The other thing is that he was at the other beach literally seconds after I was, so that would mean from where he was, he would have had to run up the beach pathway, get into his car to be there that fast. 
and why park right opposite the entrance to see if I got out my car? These are the questions that have bothered me about this scenario. Do you think I'm paranoid or did he have any intentions? I guess we'll never know. My family and I have been hunting the same property in East Texas for over 10 years. And we've had some really creepy encounters with one of the locals. The property we hunt on is timber company land. It's way off the beaten path down some dirt roads. No power, no running water, no sewer. There are very few people that live in the area. Only a few scattered hunting camps and some locals. Our closest neighbors live in a trailer about a mile away, who we've come to call the meth house. Now I'm not sure if there really is any meth going on there, but it would be hard to believe there isn't. This place has always been odd. There is a trailer sitting in the middle of a pine clearing. The brush is fairly overgrown around the trailer, almost as if the property is abandoned. There have always been broken down cars and other junk strewn throughout the front. Cow skulls and hip bones are attached to a pine tree in front of the house, going up about 15 to 20 feet. It started out with maybe 10, and over the years has grown to about 20. For a long time, I thought that was the oddest thing about the place. 2017, things started to get weirder. The front yard collection began to grow. A rotted out taxidermy of a wild hog was added to the skull tree. A doll head was fixed with horns and some kind of gown and mounted on a stick by the side of the dirt road that we called the baby devil. Tripods standing about 12 feet high each were erected around the trailer made out of young pine tree trunks. One day we drove by and noticed that from these tripods hung the spinal column and rib cages of some animals. We originally thought that maybe they were using the tripods to hang and clean deer, but the same bones hung for over a year and someone would usually want to dispose of the leftover carcass because the smell can get overwhelmingly fierce very quickly. So we had no encounters with the residents and weren't even sure what they looked like. The place was creepy, but they kept to themselves until later in the season where we had two separate creepy encounters. The first happened to a good friend. He had made a quick day trip with his wife up to the property to fill feeders and ride four wheelers. To get to his spot, he had to go on the dirt road and drive right past the meth house. His spot is only a few hundred yards away from the house. While they were doing their thing, they began to hear some strange noises. As he listened closer, he could hear fast high pitched gibberish back and forth between two voices. He described it as a lot of yips, yars and yees, and the word Jesus mixed in. They decided to get on one of the four wheelers and investigate. They found two men squatted down, picture Gollum Lord of the Ring style, besides a large mud puddle in front of the house. They were splashing and bouncing around while furious and loudly speaking gibberish. Once they noticed the four wheelers, they in unison stopped talking and stared like an animal that has been spooked. My buddy took off on the four wheeler and didn't look back. The second semi encounter happened to me and my brother. We were up there alone for this weekend and were relaxing by the fire on a pitch black night after a long day's hunt. We began to hear something strange off in the distance. It was pipe organ music. There were missed notes and sporadic stops and starts. We laughed about how this seems like the setup in a horror movie and tried to ignore it. The music continued on and off for the next few hours. Then all of a sudden we hear crashing through the brush. This was very thick brush, a 
about 10 feet high and 100 feet or so deep, in between our camp and the direction of the house. This didn't sound like the usual spooked deer, armadillo rooting around, or hogs coming down the trail. It was a crash made by something large, and it was close. The rest of the night was quiet, no more organ music and no more noises in the woods. Likely, just a local little old lady practicing her organ for Sunday service the next morning, drifting over for another property. Likely it was some animal that got spooked crashing through the brush, but we sure were freaked. We made a point to not be alone overnight ever again, and kept a close eye on that house from now on. A couple of years back, me and a friend were doing a road trip. It was here where we discovered something rather unusual, a ghost town. I don't want to say exactly where it is for fear of sounding insane. Anyway, we approached the town with trepidation. Of course, we didn't realize it was abandoned at first, roads unkept, grass growing everywhere along with weeds, extremely high, houses completely torn apart. Doors had been ripped off the hinges, windows shattered, and a whole load of graffiti. As we drove around, it became increasingly more apparent that people no longer inhabited this area. Roots of trees were already taking back the road, and foliage was covering a large part of some of the houses. We drove around for a little bit, and after getting bored after about five minutes, we decided it was enough driving around, and wanted to explore just a little bit. We left our vehicles and looked around. In the middle of the village, there was a bandstand with a square. That despite being abandoned, was still in pretty good shape. There was something about it that really drew me to it. So as my friend went to look at one of the houses behind where we parked the car, I decided to go look at that instead. As my feet started walking across the grass, I approached the bandstand with trepidation. I climbed the three or four steps to be on the concrete of the structure, and looked around and surveyed the area. That's when I noticed something very eerie. I looked up. There was a pentagram painted on the roof of the bandstand. And as I looked around, I saw a chicken carcass, or what I think was a chicken carcass, hanging from a rope by the top. It was severely decayed. It had obviously been there for a very long time. The meat was partially still on it, blackened and disgusting. The funny thing is, I didn't smell anything. But the moment I saw it, I bolted and started running back to the vehicle. But my friend had locked the car and was still in one of the houses. I started screaming for him, and he told me to calm down, and that it was probably just a prank. He convinced me that I was being ridiculous, and he carried on the exploration. I chose to sit by the car and wait, however. A few minutes later, do I hear my friend's voice from the house. He's screaming taking two steps at a time, runs out the hole where the door was, and unlocks the car and jumps into the driver's seat. I don't even need to ask. I'm looking at the house where he's running out of. And that's where I see a man, completely disheveled and insane looking, with a crazy look in his eye, wielding a blood-stained hatchet. We don't speak, we just drive. We stopped at a gas station and discussed what we saw before filling up our gas. However, our dialogue was extremely limited. 
Do you see the guy? Yeah. Do you think he strung up that chicken there? Yeah. Yeah, me too. That was about as much as we said about it. And when we looked at each other, there was an unspoken sort of agreement that we would never discuss this again. Why was a crazy man living in the middle of nowhere in a ghost town? I don't think I'll ever know, nor do I want to find out. A girlfriend and I took a two week road trip last year and backwards camped slash hiked the whole time. Insight, I am also a girl, two 20 something year olds out on the road. We got to one free campsite in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, and we were the only people there, which isn't unusual. So we just take the first spot and set up. As we make dinner, a couple pulls in, drives by and heads to the back of the campground. About 20 minutes later, they come back and flag me down. Have you guys been back there? No, it's a massacre back there. What do you mean? There's bones everywhere. Mind if we take the spot next to you? Not at all. Now we're happy to have neighbors. They stay maybe two minutes, look around and then get back in their car and leave. What was all that about? My friend asked. I explained to my friend what the girl said. And at that moment, we look down and see a huge femur bone under our feet, possibly a cow. Well, us being a little cryptic, we decide to go check out what they were talking about. We get about 100 yards back through the windy camp. And there it is. Full blown animal carcasses everywhere. Some scattered, some still whole. One pile is what looks like fox fur and another deer body still in a trash bag. Our theory is that they dumped roadkill and scraped it off the highway there. But we didn't figure this out until a few days later. Nonetheless, if there's that many bodies here, from whatever cause, then other predatory animals know we're here too. And I don't want to be around where they come by for dinner. We decided to pack up and find a different camp. This was a few nights later. We drive around for about an hour or so still in the middle of nowhere. And we haven't seen a single car the entire time. No houses, just old country roads and pastures. Mind you, the sun is starting to set. The road turns to dirt for a bit. And we cross a cattle guard and see the national park sign. Sweet. It's a national park. And it's free. It can't be too bad. My friend thinks it looks a little sketchy, but we're ready to relax and grab some grub. So I hit a left and start up the hill to the National Park. Looks like it's only about two miles from the map. And we start going up this road and get around a few curbs and the brush on the side starts getting thicker and thicker. And the road begins getting rougher. Now to put this into perspective, we're in my fairly new Chevy Cruze manual transition that is less than a foot clearance from the ground, about a quarter mile in and we high center on a huge rock. Okay, as long as this doesn't get much worse, I think we can manage. There's no possible way to turn around or back out anyway. So we keep going. And of course, it gets worse. Every rock and trench, we hear the car scrape and stutter and stall. I'm clinching the wheel, she's clinching the handle, and all the brush on the side of us is now dead and eerie looking, as the sun is almost gone behind us. 30 terrifying minutes later, we finally make it to the top flat that is supposed to be the campsite. It's about a 10 foot clearing in the dead brush. And in front of us, a cliff. We're still freaked out about the dead animals. And now we feel like we're in the plot of some low budget horror film, literally trapped on top of this hill. It's dark, and neither of us want to get out the car. 
we decide we cannot in our right mind stay here. Even from this cliff top, we can't see a single house nor car light. We make a 10 point turn between the brush and boulders and cliff and manage to get back on the path and very slowly and carefully crap ourselves all the way back down that damned hill. We and the car miraculously survive and we head another two hours back to the closest town to sleep in the Walmart parking lot. I live in rural Australia, in a neighbourhood a few kilometres away from a small town next to the beach. This neighbourhood is pretty much just thick forest, some roads and maybe 20 houses scattered around. I get dropped off from school at a bus stop with a neighbour where I have to walk about a kilometre through thick bush and forest to get home. One day when I was in sixth grade, I was on the bus home from school. As we got close to my neighbourhood, I started seeing more and more police cars parked on the side of the road, and even an NRMA helicopter flying around. Me and my friends thought it was weird, but didn't think too much of it. I got off the bus with my friend and noticed that their mum was waiting for them. Again a bit strange, but nothing crazy. I said goodbye and started walking off when my friend's mum called me over. I walked over and she told me that there was a shirtless, panicked man on the loose in our area. He was also wounded and had a weapon that the police wouldn't disclose. She said that he was meant to be extremely dangerous and then I should come home to her place instead of walking home through the bush. I was scared, but I got to my friend's house so I didn't complain. On the drive there, we made up heaps of theories, but none of them turned out to be true. We got to their place and I just hung around until my mum could leave work to fetch me. I got back to my house and started talking to my mum. By now, there were police cars everywhere and about 10 helicopters scanning the area. My mum and dad said that the police had told them his name and some more details about him. He was an addict with a bad criminal record that had apparently been wounded in a fight and ran off. He was rumoured to have a firearm and was apparently in our backyard at one point. At the exact time I would have been coming home from school. That was close. The helicopters kept on tracking him by report and sightings and eventually he left the area. Later that night, police called up the residents and told them he had been caught. We slept okay knowing we weren't going to perish. But the next morning it turned out he hadn't actually been caught. I can't remember who told us, but he was certainly still on the loose. It was also found out that before he came to our neighbourhood, he had assaulted a woman and stolen her car and drove into our area because of the kilometres and kilometres of thick forest to hide in. A bunch of other stuff also came up involving in drug trafficking and that he had been crashing with some drug dealers in one of my friend's neighbouring houses. There were a bunch more things that led me to believe there was something else very fishy going on. The police got sniffer dogs in later that day and they kept searching to no avail. After a week he still wasn't caught and a class trip had to be cancelled because he was still in the area. But some weeks later, they finally apprehended him. And that case was closed. There's still a lot of confusion and some weird things that happened, and the police won't share any details. But he was caught. So that's fine, I guess. A few years ago, my dad, my brother-in-law, my best friend and myself were tasked with refueling a group of eight that was hiking the John Muir Trail. For some reason, we were recommended a trail that would be a shortcut and only six miles to the lake that would become our base camp. We later found out it was about 6,700 feet of elevation gain. The trail starts off on the eastern side of the Sierras, which is essentially the desert. So in order to beat the August heat, we started on the trail at 3am. Our packs were all loaded, tipping the scales at over 50 pounds each, which was our gear, food 
and weak supply of food for the eight we were refueling. The first couple of miles were made up of super sandy switchbacks. By the time the sun came up, we were all out of water, despite the fact that we had packed extra, because we knew there wasn't a source for the first few miles. As dehydration started to set in, we encountered a small section, maybe a 100 yards of trail that was almost completely washed out. The main issue was that it was only about 12 inches wide of slippery granite with a vertical wall on one side and an easily 500 foot drop straight to the valley floor on the other. This was the first point on the hike where I feared for our lives, but we made it. Once we passed this point, we entered the tree line and found a creek for water. We kept moving up what seemed to be vertical trail for the next few hours until we reached a meadow and another source of water. We came across a guy who told us he had just found a dead body, an apparent suicide in a tent just up the trail. Creeped out, we pumped our water filters as fast as we could and continued up the trail. For the next few hours, we marched up switchbacks until the point that I heard my dad, who had fallen a little behind, scream out for me. I dropped my pack and sprinted on my noodle legs back down the trail where I found him. He was curled up in the fetal position in a puddle of his own vomit. He kept saying he wanted to take a quick nap, and I thought for sure I was going to watch him pass there. After regathering ourselves and letting him rest for a bit, we started to move again. At this point, we were once again low on water, but the map indicated we were fairly close to a lake. I kid you not, when we finally got to the lake, it was completely dry. We continued on to our resting point, only to find that my brother-in-law, as he moved quicker while I stayed with my dad, was nearly incapacitated because he sprained his knee. We all slept like logs, and the next day my dad and I hiked the other group supplies the final leg of the trail to the rendezvous point, while the other two stayed back at base camp because of the knee sprain. On our way to the rendezvous point, we crossed paths with three guys who looked like they'd come straight out of the 70s. They informed us the trail we were coming up on is really only recommended for going out. The three of us then proceeded to strip down, frolic and sunbathe at Base Camp Lake as we moved up the trail. After our whole crap storm of a backpacking trip, we get back to the trailhead where we find my dad's car won't start and won't take a jump from the car we had taken and ended up needing an alternator. The good news is that we were able to refuel the other group, and we all survived. However, we collectively look back at this near-death experience, and words will never truly explain what happened. This happened to my mum, sister and me many years ago. I was around 8, and I'm 37 now. My sister is 5 years younger. Back then, we lived in a city in the UK in a not so nice part of town. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't the ghetto or the Wild West, but there were much nicer places to live. My dad was self-employed and owned a small factory in the outskirts of the city center, about five miles from our home. His factory was surrounded by wasteland, mostly derelict homes and dilapidated buildings. This was all he and his business partner could afford at the time, you see. The area was grey, dirty, covered in graffiti. Hell, not even the city homeless would take refuge in the decaying buildings after dark. One day, my dad called my mum at home. He needed her to come to the factory to help him finish a job. Back then, they only had one car, so it meant us getting on the bus. I didn't mind. My eight-year-old self was full of adventure and loved the idea of riding the bus to Big Town. The bus ride was uneventful. And we braved the city traffic, 
eventually arriving at our stop. As described earlier, it's not the type of place people go unless they have a specific reason to go there. So it wasn't surprising we were the only ones to get off at that particular stop. We started in the direction of my dad's factory, which was just under a mile from the bus stop. My sister was asleep on her pushchair, and I was jabbering away as only an eight year old can. When I suddenly became aware, my mom was preoccupied. I looked at her, but she told us to keep walking in a hushed voice. I noticed she kept glancing over her shoulder. I slowed down to take a look, but she tugged my arm and told me to carry on going. I remember feeling anxious as my mom walked faster, the pushchair bumping over the uneven paving slabs and my legs struggling to keep rhythm. Then I heard him. First the footsteps, clumsy and heavy, then his low rasping voice. He was muttering incoherently, having a conversation with himself. Suddenly my mum crossed the road, holding my arm tightly while steering the pushchair with one hand. He crossed the road too. My mum cursed under her breath, and after a minute or so we crossed back again. Whenever you think you're being followed, there's always the nagging doubt you are just being paranoid. So when we crossed the same road for a fourth time in five minutes, with creepy McCreepy person still hot on our tails, still muttering the occasional shout, we knew full well this guy was following us. This was back in the late 80s, so no mobile phones, no internet, and no text messaging you really were off the grid. By now I could feel the adrenaline radiating from my mum. We were approaching a T junction, and my dad's factory was around the corner to the left, about 400 yards down the road. If you didn't know where it was, you would assume we were heading further into the concrete ghost town. As we turned the corner, my mum told me to run as fast as I can and get my dad. I could hear my mum and the puss chair thundering behind me. My heart was pounding in my ears as I ran like our lives depended on it. My feet crunched on some broken glass, but I didn't dare slow down. I could see the small road ahead leading to the car park of the factory. I knew what I had to do. I shouted for my dad as loudly as I could. My throat was burning as I gulped for air, as hot tears stained my red cheeks. I burst through the door crying. My dad heard and came out running. I didn't need to say anything. He grabbed the nearest object and ran out the door across the park. I stood looking out the doorway, sobbing heavily, watching my dad sprint across the car park. Relief washed over me as I saw the pushchair round the corner. My mum told my dad that we were being followed, and pointed in the direction we had come from. My dad took off, but came back five minutes later. The creep was nowhere to be seen. My dad said he'd probably run off when he heard me shouting. With all the old empty buildings and wasteland, it was just too easy to disappear. My dad wanted to take the car and drive around to see if he could find him. But my mum didn't want to be left alone, even inside the sanctuary of the factory. So he agreed to finish up the job, and we could go home. My parents never reported this to the police. Living in a major city, you get all kinds of unsavoury characters. And because he never physically harmed us, he didn't get the chance, mind you. They probably would have chalked up his behaviour to being high or mentally ill. But either way, it scared the bejesus out of us, some creep, following us around in the ghost town. I'm originally from the Gulf Coast of Texas, and when I was a kid growing up there, it was very easy to go from the bustling bright lights of Houston to the dark, deserted country road in only a few minutes. Not so much the case now, 
but ask anyone who's been far out in the country, away from any city or town, and they'll tell you that it gets dark out there. You can see the Milky Way in all its glory, but unless the moon is full and bright, you can't see your hands in front of your face. When driving, all you can see is the area illuminated by your headlights. Everything else is swallowed by the gloom. My father's family is scattered around the Gulf Coast, including cousins that lived far out in the middle of nowhere. One night, my parents, my brother and my eight-year-old self were returning from a visit from one of those cousins just a few days after Halloween of 1988. My brother and I were in the back seat, quietly talking about a show that we'd watched once trick-or-treating had been over with. The show had talked about a shape-shifting ghost that liked to take the form of oncoming headlights that never passed. And my brother and I were talking about how weird and creepy it would be to see something like that. Our dad then mentioned that he had seen those before and that in the back roads of Texas were a hotbed of a paranormal activity. No sooner had the words left his mouth, a mile or so ahead of us, a pair of headlights appeared facing us. None of us thought anything of it, other than to laugh at the coincidence. It was nothing unusual to encounter another car or two at all hours of the night in such areas. We kept driving down the road, and with the four of us talking about various things, until my brother noticed the headlights which was still facing us and had not gotten any closer. Cue the sudden total silence inside our family car as we all stared at the headlights. We kept going down this completely dark, otherwise empty road and those lights stayed the same distance away from us, never getting any closer and never changing directions. I don't know how long we stared at them, but eventually, my brother and I began to get a little freaked out, and we ducked down out of sight behind the front seats. Not too long after that, Dad turned off that road and floored it, and the rest of the drive home was made in total silence. I never saw anything like that again even though we traveled up and down that road on many occasions after that. And a couple of years later, we ended up moving to Illinois to be closer to my mother's family. And while the back roads of Illinois can be creepy, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget seeing those headlights keeping pace with us right after we discussed that very thing. I come from a chaotic upbringing. I was born and raised as a child in South Korea, and then later moved to Australia with my mother having lost my father in a homicide. The next few years of my life in Australia were difficult. Meeting and making friends was challenging in the early noughties, particularly since I was quite nerdy and didn't speak much English, something most Australian kids at the time did not relate to well. One of the scariest moments was from when I was age 12. At the time, it didn't even occur to me how close I was from potentially losing my life. My mother and I were on a road trip heading south from Melbourne to stay on the southern coast. We had stopped one evening at a small, well-kept caravan park. The caravan park was quaint and beautiful, neat grass, nice flowers, and a small creek which ran along the edge of the premises. It reminded me of home. I spent some time walking around on my own as my mother was taking a nap, and I discovered a game and a pool room. I went inside and spent probably a few hours playing pool by myself and generally just mucking around when a young boy came in. I was very shy, and so was he, so we eventually talked for a little bit and became friendly. I don't remember playing any games with him, but I do recall him being pretty nervous. 
He kept asking me if I wanted to go back to his caravan as his parents were making dinner soon. At first, I wasn't interested and said no. We spent some more time doing things and talked as it got later, and he became more pushy and asked me if I liked cake and lollies. Of course, I said. I followed him to his caravan, which was much older than ours and quite dilapidated. He asked for me to wait outside while he spoke to his parents. I waited patiently for a few minutes until the door opened and a large older man with glasses and no shirt opened the door and asked if I would like to come inside for cake. I was scared, but I remember feeling like I had to, like it would be rude for me to leave. And as I walked into the door, I heard a man shout behind me, Hey, what's going on here? I was quickly grabbed from my collar of my shirt, or dress, and the man then quickly tried to lock the door behind me. However, the stranger was too quick and burst in the door. He took my hand abruptly and pulled me outside and we ran. The man asked which unit room slash caravan I was in and took me straight there. We went inside and my mum yelled at him asking what he was doing there. I was hiding in the corner crying while he explained what happened. We packed up and left that night. I was already heavily on anxiety medication after what happened back home, and we never spoke of it again. My mother claimed it was something I should talk to my therapist about. Every time we spoke about it, my mother would leave the room. It scared the hell out of her. And I did not really understand why. I guess at that age, it's difficult for the brain to comprehend the reality slash potential of a situation. Looking back on it now, it scares me to the point of losing sleep. I'm just glad that Good Samaritan possibly saved my life. I live in Pennsylvania and have heard and found so many scary and creepy stories in this state. I'm not originally from here. And it also creeped me out to learn that Dave Politis said the entire state of Pennsylvania is a cluster. I live in the woods. There are a lot of beautiful woods here in Pennsylvania. And the seasons are so nice, especially the beautiful fall colors. Like I said, I do live in the woods. And some creepy things happen here. I live on a very high cliff and below are huge boulders, small caves, a creek, and miles of woods. It's beautiful and peaceful, yet sometimes creepy. I have a motion sensor light on the side near the cliff, and in the evening while doing the dishes or cooking, that light goes on and off an unusual amount of times. I always look out the window, I can never see what's setting it off. Of course, it could be bats the majority of the time. However, I have a German Shepherd, and at least a few times a month, she needs to go out to do her business, or she may hear something that she needs to investigate. Like most GSDs, she's very protective and guards very well. Sometimes I'll open the door and she will look out. Then her hairs will stand up along her haunches and spine. And she will back up and refuse to go outside. This is really creepy. Especially if it's one of those evenings when that motion sensor light comes on a high number of times. This dog is very brave and extremely protective. She has never acted afraid of any person or animal. She has one focus, to kill what comes in her yard or near her family. So when she does this thing, I tell you it scares me. And I certainly don't want to know what is scaring her. If anyone's dogs do this, I'd love to know. I've never had a dog do this before. Could it just be a smell? She's been sprayed by skunks and isn't afraid of smells as far as I'm aware. I'd appreciate anyone's input.
This story takes place when I was a boy, very young, with a thirsty desire to travel. My friends and I had banded together all our money to go on a trip through Africa. It was an enlightening experience. And on one of our experiences, we were taking a tour through an abandoned mine town. We were allowed to roam around this town for a little while. And as we were going our separate ways, the tour guide gave us very specific instructions to stay within the ring. There was an area where we were not permitted to go. And we all agreed that we wouldn't go there. However, I was absent mindedly throwing my hat into the air. And my hat was blown by the wind into the area we're not supposed to go in. So me knowing I wouldn't be in the area for very long, did I scoop past and make my way there to collect my hat. Once I'd already passed this barrier, did I feel confident that I could at least have a peek? There was a small hut where my hat had landed. And I thought for the sake of curiosity, that I might as well look inside. I grabbed my hat, put it on my head, and look into this small structure. There were still decaying beds on the floor made from straw and other random assortments of garbage. Nothing worth talking about. I turn around and make my way back across the line. Later that day, my tour guide is finishing up as we are arriving back at the hotel. When one of the women of the tour asks, why we weren't allowed to go to that part of the town. He says that there is a curse laid on that town, apparently, and that bad energy and spirits follow those who have stood on the cursed ground. And that even if we don't believe it, it is mostly for our safety. He says this in a jolly tone, one to signify that he doesn't believe it either and that we should take it with a grain of salt. Most of the tour bus laughs, and the tour ends shortly after. When we arrive back to the hotel, I instantly go to bed, forgetting all about the land I stood on that was allegedly cursed. But during the middle of the night, I hear something, footsteps and talking, coming up to the side of my bed talking in a language I don't understand. And when I open my eyes, there's nothing there. I try going back to sleep. And a few hours later, the talking continues. Is there someone in the room? I turn around, facing the direction where the noise is coming from, and open my eyelids extremely slowly and purposefully. And standing there is a man or at least a shadow of a man, made entirely of dark mass. I can't conceal my dread. My eyes open wide, and I scream loudly. The shadow, the thing, looks down upon me, and then vanishes. I knew at that moment that I had messed up, and that I should never have stood on the cursed ground. When we go back to the tour guide for the final leg of our tour, do I tell him what I had done, but don't make it sound as bad as what I actually did. And he told me not to worry, and that we would be fine. However, the shadow man kept appearing for me every night for the rest of my time in that country. It took about a week. But after a while, I finally stopped seeing him. I was very scared that I would be cursed for life, which is something I couldn't deal with. A word of caution to you all. If you are told to not step on cursed ground, don't. The consequences are severely spooky. I used to move around a lot when I was a kid. My dad was an engineer, and he would get better job offers elsewhere. 
and there were also some drug circumstances involved that made us move when his employers found out. Anyway, one of the states I lived in for a few years was North Carolina. I forget the city, I could ask my mum, but regardless I was about seven years old. I lived about a block away from a pretty sizable chunk of land that was heavily forested. My sister, brother and neighbour and me would all go there when we were hanging out and got bored with our trampoline. We used to go there to just suck on some honeysuckle bushes that were right at the edge of the woods, but sooner or later decided to go in. It was broad daylight when we went in, and after about an hour and a half of walking around aimlessly, we found this really old looking treehouse. The house itself was just a cube of wood, although it was seriously tilted due to age. Off one of the branches was a swing that was just a rope and a piece of wood. Really uncomfortable if you aren't a kid. And even if you are a kid, you still get rashes in uncomfortable places from the rope. I had found it first, so I started to climb up the ladder slowly. I'd say it was only 13 to 15 feet off the ground. As I was doing that, my sister and neighbour went to the swing, and my brother started looking around the treehouse. He found a bunch of unmarked bottles and broken glass. The wood ladder led to an opening, and inside was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Pictures. What looked like hundreds and hundreds of pictures. They were all hung up by tacks in the wood. What was really weird was that it didn't seem to have any particular theme. I'll list a few things that stand out. There was one of a picture of a pole that looked like it was in a rundown basement of a house. The flash was turned on and everything else was dark. I don't know why this one stands out to me so much, but it does. There were a lot of pictures clustered together of different families who were in public places like zoos or museums, and they were never looking at the camera. I saw several pictures of neighborhoods surrounding the area and particular houses that were singled out where the cameraman went around the house taking pictures from every angle he could during daylight hours. I did see my neighborhood, but not my house, thankfully. There were tons of pictures of landscapes and landmarks. They just looked like your run of the mill photos, nothing out of the ordinary. So yeah, after looking around for a few minutes, my brother just came up and saw everything and freaked out. He made us all leave and told us to not talk about it. My sister told our mom about it a year later when we moved to Florida, and she freaked out. Looking back, I think it was possible that it could have been a really weird artsy person, but it's so borderline creepy, I can't really imagine it being anything but a mentally unstable person. Perhaps that's my own interpretation though. This happened to me about 10 years ago and stays with me vividly as one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced, and I don't usually believe in paranormal things. Our family were renovating a very old house in rural Australia, over a hundred years old, which we were about halfway through the renovation. We were staying in another small outhouse while doing the renovation, but we had family and friends coming to stay with us, so I had to forfeit my normal bedroom and stay in the main house in a tent, as it was nowhere near ready to sleep in. Most of the nights, I woke around 3am to our working dogs about 200 meters away from the house, going absolutely nuts barking at something, but I usually didn't pay much attention to them, as kangaroos often jump near their kennels and set them off some nights. As their barking came to a stop, I could faintly hear crisp and clear footsteps out the room I was in and down the hallway getting louder and clearly slower making their way towards my room. I didn't think much of it at first, but the direction the noise was coming from was so clear. The footsteps slowly made their way up to the room and hallway and stopped at what I thought to be the doorway of the room. I was locked up with fear at what the hell was standing in the doorway and trying to figure out what I could do. And then it started moving again, only this time straight towards my tent and stopped right next to it. And I was waiting for the tent to start shaking but it only stopped for a brief second and then walked into the corner of the room and stopped. 
The fear I felt at that moment kept me paralyzed for what felt like hours. I was sweating and had a blanket over me and was too afraid to move. After a while, I eventually calmed down enough to get my light I had with me, open the zippers of the tent, and look out to which I found nothing in the room. So I climbed back into the tent and somehow managed to get back to sleep, as I never heard anything more. In the morning, I woke up fairly early and went back over to the little outhouse and tell my parents my story and ask them if they were just messing with me, but they were adamant they didn't do anything. To add to the strange noise of the footsteps, there were loose floorboards all over the hallway floor, drying out, spaced tightly together, getting ready to be put down in the coming weeks. So I decided to try and replicate those footstep noises, but couldn't, as the boards on the floor would move and make completely different sounds. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was just my head playing tricks on me, or if there was something strange going on in that house. About a year ago, I was out back with my family. It was around eight, and the sun was setting. We lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbor lived far away, and something down the field kept catching my eye, but I ignored it at first. My sister saw it too, and kept looking out towards the trees. She was getting freaked out about it. My mum said to go investigate, so me and my sister started to walk across the field towards the tree line. Big mistake. It's hard for me to describe. This was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I didn't see it at first, and I didn't understand why my sister was so scared, until we were about a hundred yards away, when I saw this creature. Tall, probably eight to nine feet tall, white, humanoid with an elongated head, and no face. It had long arms and peeked around the trees. We stopped in our tracks. We couldn't tell what it was. It took a few steps further out of the trees and swayed back and forth, looking at me like a praying mantis. Me and my sister ran screaming back to the house, where my mum stood, jaw dropped. She'd seen it too. I had never been so scared in my life. We grabbed the binoculars and watched this terrifying creature peek in and out of the tree line, spying on us. My grandma thought we all had a wild imagination. The sun was almost gone now, and it was getting really dark, and the darker it got, the more it moved, back and forth along the trees. It was terrifying. So we went in for the night and locked everything up tight. I couldn't sleep that night. I was hearing scratching on the roof, and at one point, a very loud bang and various noises coming from the barn. I was very afraid that I would wake up to my animals missing. The next morning, my grandma asked if we had heard the loud bangs outside that night. She ended up taking my grandpa with her on her morning walk. I have no idea what it was, and it still haunts me to this day. This happened around 14 years ago. I was around eight at the time, and at a family cookout in a haunted ghost town called Pickneyville in South Carolina. Now I know what you're thinking. Why the hell am I at a cookout in a ghost town? Well, a family friend owns the land that surrounds it and still does. I'm not sure what the event was for, but back then we were always barbecuing and riding ATVs through the trails of rural upstate South Carolina. It is just what we did. Now I had always heard stories about this place from my mother and father, but always brushed them off as bull or campfire tales. There's also rumors of the area being inhabited by devil worshippers, 
but I'm unsure if that's true or not. I just didn't really believe this place was truly haunted. Until... Me and my cousin were riding our ATVs down one of the many trails. Just me, him and no one else. We're both really young. It's broad daylight and we're riding down and both need to take a whiz. So we stop, cut off our rides and do what we need to do. Now I can't speak for my cousin, but I felt really weird. Like something just didn't seem right. Everything seemed dead. There was no wind, no birds chirping, nothing. So after we relieved ourselves, we turned around and noticed a dilapidated building. Why we didn't notice this before, I don't know. Regardless, we were curious, but we knew enough history of the area to not go messing around in old buildings. So we looked around and quickly noticed old tombstones that could easily have been mistaken for large rocks. They were very old and weathered. We had just taken a leak on an old haunted graveyard. We looked at each other at the exact same time and I could see the oh shit look in his eye before he even said it. We quickly jumped back on our ATVs and desperately tried to start the engines to no avail. I turned the key, pushed the start button and nothing. It was almost as if the battery was dead and my cousin's ATV again was the same. For about 10 seconds, we just tried to get our vehicles to start. And luckily, just when we thought we were screwed, at the same time, both our engines fired up and we proceeded to get out of there as quick as possible. When we got back to the rest of our families, we didn't mention it to anyone. I really don't know why but I was just happy to be within the safety of my dad. We didn't ride the ATVs for the rest of the day, and I haven't been to Pickneyville since. When I was about 11 to 12 years old, a friend and I decided to cycle deep into the countryside to escape from the hectic city full of warmth due to it being in the midst of August. After a number of stops here and there, we came upon an area of forestry and decided to wander around, see if we could find anything interesting. But all there was were bird eggs, shotgun shells, and ripped fabrics around the area. But after coming to the end of the forest, we found something we thought we'd never come across. In front of our eyes was an old derelict castle that looked like it was burnt down some time ago. Even though it had a sign that said, private property do not cross, being the adventurous, and of course, rebellious children that we were, we walked in without hesitation. A large majority of the insides were overgrown, and the floors above had collapsed. Even though at least 85% of the castle had been destroyed, you could still make out which rooms were such as the living rooms had the fireplace and the kitchen due to the floor tiles being unlike the rest of the castle that consisted of wooden floors. Our adventure soon came to an end as we saw a car pulling into the driveway. So as fast as we could, we ran back and through the forest back out to the country lanes. But our bikes were missing and were no longer where we had left them. And after 20 minutes of looking, we accepted that they were most likely stolen. My friend rang his mum, and after an hour of giving directions, she finally arrived and we headed home. The first thing I searched when I arrived home were castles in that area and managed to find a whole article on the castle, but on a paranormal page. It turns out that it was burnt down in 1925 by the IRA, and two children and the maid were burnt to a crisp. The parents of the children were away that night, but due to the family being broken apart, the mother ended her own life in the castle, followed by the father a few weeks after this. 
This wasn't the only tragedy that happened in the house, as an actress was ended in that house before the family moved in. And during the 1978 rebellion, an Irish man who butchered English soldiers stayed in the house for a number of years and used the basement as a murder cellar. During the 1960s, when the land was brought by a farmer, a local priest had to be called in to perform an exorcism. And as soon as he took out a cross, appeared the ghost of the butcher and disappeared in a puff of black smoke. I don't know if this is all true, but it was creepy knowing that we explored the place where all of this stuff took place. When I was around 12, I liked to take the dog out and go poking around the fells near my house, looking for fossils and generally roaming around the place feeling solitary. One day in a big pit of loose stone, I unearthed a bone as I was looking for interesting fossils, and then another, and another. There was a complete and undisturbed sheep skeleton buried there under the rocks, totally clean, no flesh or other organic matter left at all, just the clean perfect bones laid out there, hidden under half a foot of loose rocks. This all happened around the start of the first period of serious depression I got into. Things got very, very bad, and I became very isolated and withdrawn. I'd take the dog out across the fells more often, and just walk around, getting a little relief and being totally alone. I revisited the place with the sheep skeleton many times, and started stacking rocks in a circle around it. I'd already gotten a bit of a wall going in a circle where I'd uncovered the bones. So I was just really building that up. It was kind of cathartic and cleansing to go out there and haul the biggest heaviest rocks that I could find to build my little wall, my shrine to the forgotten sheep, fitting the raw rock together like the dry stone walls of old, picking out rocks just the right size and shape to slot into my circle. The circle was probably around eight feet across and a couple of feet high on the day that it really started to rain while I was working on it. I didn't much care. It was summer and not too cold and the dog didn't mind. But I think that I scared the crap out of two middle aged walkers who ran across me. They rounded a bend wearing their walking boots and rain gear to find a teenager in a t-shirt, dirty jeans, and ripped grubby trainers, hauling a massive rock towards a circle full of bones in the pouring rain. I stood for a moment staring open mouthed at the male half of the couple. The three of us kind of stood there in place. Then they kind of shuffled around and turned back the way they came and I resumed hauling my rocks around in the rain. Several years ago, my ex partner and I visited his parents in North Yorkshire, England for a short break. We did lots of sightseeing and visiting while we were there. One of the days his parents asked if we would like them to take us out on a day to a place called Ravenscar them driving, knowing how much local knowledge his father had of the area, because before he retired, he was high up in the local council. And we decided it would be a nice day out because it's always nice to go places where people have knowledge of the area and local history. Ravenscar has quite a bit of history going back to being a Roman signal station. But more recently in the late 19th and early 20th century, they tried turning it into a holiday resort like Scarborough, which isn't too far away. This fascinated us because it's one of Britain's ghost towns because it was never finished and was abandoned. However, I must add at the time of us going there, we knew nothing apart from the bit of information his father gave us. Anyway, when we were there, he drove us around the site slowly. When the finished roads 
showed us points of interest like complete pavements, drains, areas marked out where hotels and houses were going to be built, but just never were. Just like driving around a small housing estate, where the roads and pavements were finished, but the buildings were never built. It was fascinating and quite eerie. There's also a mine, and old brickwork as well as an abandoned railway line. Anyway, now the weird bit. Several years later, we visited again, this time taking my children. We thought it would be fun to take them there and show them a bit of local history and let them run around. We told them all about it and some of the things that they would see. But just as we drove in, we thought we must have taken a wrong turn because there was nothing there, just a big field. We drove a short distance to the information center to ask them where it was because we couldn't remember. The woman looked at us like we were insane and said, this is the right place. Extremely confused, we decided to walk back to the site to see if we could see what we did several years earlier. But it was nothing like it. There was just dirt tracks and no roads, no pavements, only remnants of where they had been. The odd drain, but nothing like what we'd seen. By now the children thought we'd gone mad, and honestly we couldn't give them answers. When we got back to his parents' house and told them about our experience, we only felt more insane, because they told us what we described didn't exist, and clearly had been something very different to what was there now, and also than what his parents were seeing when they drove us around that day. What happened? I'll never know. But it stayed with me, and I often think about it, because it was such a surreal experience. Back in 2001, I was 21, working in a hotel bar 10 miles from my home. This was on Christmas Eve. I had to work that night. The hotel was open and I was the new kid on the job, so I had to. I closed the bar at 2am, went to change my clothes, and went to my motorcycle. It was really cold at the time, so sometimes I would take a very narrow country road that cutted my trip almost to half which was only used by residents of a few houses. I used it as I could exit near the main road on the motorcycle. A car could not. It was me and my friend from work on the motorcycle, and after maybe a mile in said road, in the middle of nowhere, near one of the houses, I saw something when passing by the house gate. I then stopped maybe 60 to 80 feet from the house gate. We both looked back, and there it was, like straight out of a movie. The typical Hollywood alien. It looked 6.5 to 7 feet tall, with grey skin, the oval face, the dark eyes, the complete package. We stared at it for 10 seconds and it stared back at us. Then I proceeded to get the hell out of there. We both agreed to ourselves that it was just an idiot in a costume. For the next few years, I told this story to some close friends and family, just like I'm telling you now. We then went to separate jobs, but would occasionally see my friends, and we would always share a laugh about it. But we would always say, what the hell was a guy doing in an alien costume at 2am on Christmas in the middle of nowhere, in those pitch black woods? Now I'm 36 years old, and I'm a science kind of guy. I do believe that we are not alone, but I find it hard to believe 99% of the stuff we read. I would still like to think it was just an idiot in a costume, but I will forever think what the hell? So I live in rural Australia, and this happened quite a few years ago, but is a story worth telling. The layout of our property consisted of a fairly standard four bedroom house, 
and a massive shed that my dad used to keep all his furniture, machinery and tools in. This shed was around 100 meters from the house and had those lights that takes a while to warm up before lighting up properly. So I was around 17 at the time. It was the middle of winter and it was getting dark at around 6pm. I was just finishing up working on my car in the driveway when from the work shed, I hear my mum in a panic, scream for help. I sprinted up to the shed, the yelling continuing the whole time. I assumed she had walked into the shed for something. And instead of bothering with waiting for the lights, she walked in the dark and tripped on something. I ran into the shed and hit the lights, grabbing a torch because it was pitch black inside. This closed the shed. I heard my mum yell my name once more clearly, in pain and coming from the far side of the shed. I started walking my way back to the shed, yelling to my mum, but not getting any replies. When I get about halfway, my dad sticks his head in the door and asks what I'm yelling about. I'm telling him about mum being in trouble and he pauses and quickly tells me to get out of the shed and that mum is fine. Absolutely and completely confused, I walk back to the door of the shed, and both of us walk back to the house. I'm shaken, and I keep telling him I swear mum is hurt in the shed. When we get back to the house, mum walks out the front door drying her hair with a towel after getting out the shower. I didn't know how to react. I explained to both of them what happened, and they both brush it off saying it was weird, but that I probably imagined it. That weekend, my older sister who moved out two years before this event came home for a visit. Sitting on the grass besides the house and the shed, I told her what happened. And she went white, and told me that a few years before she moved out, the exact same thing happened to her when she got home from work one night. Except mum called my sister's phone when she was in the shed, wanting to know what she wanted for dinner. My sister never told a soul about her experience only refused to ever go into the shed again. We both wondered what we would have found if we'd have gone to the back where the voice came from. My sister is a very short and petite girl, and her fiance, a six foot guy who weighs more than 200 pounds, decided to do a little vacation type thing and rented a trailer out in the middle of nowhere. Sometime during their time there, this was around 1 or 2 am, they got into a bad fight, and he stormed off to another part of the trailer, and my sister was left feeling frustrated. All of a sudden, she felt eerily calm, and then she said she got an image in her head of this clearing with rocks, and despite never having been there, she felt drawn to it, and seemed to know how to get there like something wanted her to go there. So she put on her shoes and her fiance came out and asked her where she was going. She said she was going on a walk and then left. She told me she got about 50 yards from the trailer before she was hit with this extreme and heavy dread and fear and felt that if she went any further, she would die but felt like she couldn't panic and run. So she tried her best to act calm and went back to the trailer, walked inside, closed and locked the door behind her. And before her fiance had a chance to ask what happened, they both heard something fast, way too fast and heavy, run from the forest and towards the trailer. It ran all around and over the trailer before they heard it come up the steps to the door and stop. Her fiance grabbed a knife and was going to confront whatever it was, but she begged him not to and told him there was nothing he could do to hurt it. So they didn't. She didn't get any sleep that night. And when daylight came, nothing was out there. The scariest thing she said was that they never heard it, whatever it was, leave. 
My cousin told me this story a few years ago. He was insisting I never tell anyone because they would think he's crazy. My cousin Jesse lives in Mexico. He comes over sometimes, and he always has another cousin called Johnny, who works with a small flower delivery company. It was Friday around 6 p.m. Jesse and Johnny were hanging out together playing games when Johnny's cell phone rings. It was his boss from the flower delivery company. Apparently, they had received a late order and they needed Johnny to deliver. Johnny told Jesse if he wanted to go with him, and Jesse agreed. They arrived picking up the flowers and a paper with the address so they knew where to deliver the flowers to. It's a small town about 25 miles from Johnny's house. When they arrive to the address, there's no one in sight. It started getting a little dark, so they decided to cruise around the small abandoned town, then check out the house again to see if maybe the people had arrived home. They arrived back to the addresses and still nothing, no lights whatsoever. The only lights they had were the car headlights. Across the street, there was a man who appeared to just be stood in darkness. The only part the lights would reveal was his waist and nothing else. Johnny asked the man if he knew the owners and what time they'd be back. The man told them the owners would be back in any minute, but not once did he step into the light. Johnny then told the man if he would leave the flowers in his care and when the owner arrives, if he could give them to them. The man gladly accepted. As the man approached the car, Jesse said something made both of them look down at the man's feet. He said that at that moment he was filled with terror, as where the man's feet were supposed to be were large black hairy hooves. As the man reached out, they noticed the same with his hands. Jesse quickly told Johnny they needed to leave now. Johnny threw the flowers at the man. They got into the car and sped off. Jesse said as they got into the car, the man or thing was still talking about payment for the flowers, but they ignored him as they didn't want to be there a second longer. After that, they arrived at a gas station and brought some drinks and cigarettes as they needed to calm down from the scare they just had. They kept questioning each other on what they saw, but they couldn't believe it. Once they arrived back to the flower place, they told their boss they had been robbed since the flowers were expensive and no one would believe what really happened. A few days later, Johnny went around asking about the place and people would say the town belonged to the devil himself. Today, Johnny doesn't work there anymore and Jesse says he still has nightmares about the incident. I actually believe him since my family has seen so many encounters with the paranormal. I work as a delivery driver. I was dropping a package off at this secluded home in the middle of the woods. It's a few hours away and about half an hour through windy roads in the forest. I call them ahead of time to let them know I'm nearly there. The customer's mum answers. She's very rude and yells at me over the phone stating, I will be waiting. We'll be waiting. I get it. Bye. Once I get there, I'm met by a tall man reeking of alcohol. I shake his hand. Now sometimes my hand gets sweaty for no reason, but my hands were very dry and normal. But once I shake his hands, he picks his hand up slowly above his head, staring at them like people do in the movies when they're screaming at God asking why. I then try to talk about the package. My job also includes setting up the device in the package. So I start asking him questions about the setup process. He cuts me off to tell me he's bad with technology. And if I say anything, he's going to get very angry at me. His voice is low and serious, so serious it doesn't seem real. He's slurring his words. He sounds like a movie villain, and he's speaking so insanely slow, too. After I get him to talk about the device, 
His mum pulls up. I ask her how she's doing and smile at her. She literally ignores me and looks at her son. He's giving her this creepy smile and puts up his left hand. He just moves his fingers up and down like he's waving, but only his fingers. She then sucks her and drives away. Now the guy has me move my car because he says a lot of accidents can happen where I parked. He says it multiple times. He has me move my car to a very specific spot. And at this point, I'm scared, but I'm just trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's just really weird. He then tries to get me to go into his house. He asks me multiple times if we can finish the setup inside. I don't say no, but I give him instructions on how to finish it by himself, implying I won't enter. I then tell him bye, shake his hand and leave. The incident really threw me off. Nothing in particular felt especially threatening. But I felt 95% sure that those people had some weird stuff going on that I most certainly didn't want to know about. I grew up on a property that connected to a game preserve. So my brothers and I practically ran wild in them constantly. Over the years, there were many times I felt there was something bad in the woods. Not all the time, but more at night. And not even every night. We also had an outhouse. So I'd have to go out in them at night more than your average kid. Flash forward to being 14, 15, and deciding to go get some plants to make a terrarium. We walked back the public dirt lane not far from the house and still touching our property, a place I walked with the dogs all the time, and went maybe 40 feet up the bank into our part of the woods. It's a gorgeous spring day, the sun is shining and everything is beautiful. And I realize I don't hear any birds, no squirrels, absolutely nothing. Then I hear a rhythmic tapping noise coming from further up in the woods. I figured it was a woodpecker and I kept looking for plants, but it keeps making noise only when I walk and fall silent when I do. It keeps getting closer and starts walking to rustle leaves, waiting for this darn bird to appear. The noise finally gets close enough that I should see this devious woodpecker who doesn't sound entirely like a woodpecker anymore. There's nothing. Yet it keeps coming closer and closer, making what now sounds like someone slapping their thighs in rhythm. Now it's gotten even closer. And I realize whatever it is has been messing with me the entire time to get closer. And I have that moment that makes my insides feel like they've been melted. And I'm about to crap myself because that is dread, because there's something bad almost on me. And I flew through the woods and threw myself off the edge of the six foot bank straight out of the road. How I knew I'd be safe in the road, I don't know. I just felt like a boundary it wouldn't go on in my gut. It did follow me along the road for 20 feet into the woods till I came within line of sight of my house. I didn't tell anyone for years because I felt silly. And then one night I told my mum and little brother. He just looked at me and said, Why do you think I stopped going back there? It followed me once from the other side of the road. I was living in Australia for a year. I was once a passenger carrier traveling through towns to get to the next destination. We were passing through rural towns in New South Wales that are small but still well populated. We pass by a field slash park where families are having picnics, enjoying the day, kids running around and playing. While I'm looking at the park and all the people in it with my head on the window, I all of a sudden see what looks like a grey zombie walking through it. It's walking right by families and people sitting down, but no one seems to take notice of this thing that's sticking out like a sore thumb. No one is looking up at what I assume is a freak in a Halloween costume when it's not Halloween. It's moving slowly and limping like a zombie would, but 
has a dead look in its eyes and its skin is grey. If my memory serves me correctly, even its clothes are grey. It's wearing tattered clothes and has a Frankenstein monster kind of air about it. That's the best way I can describe it. Like a grey zombie Frankenstein monster. My eyes follow it the entire time while my bus passes the park, which is only for a moment. But the thing that freaks me out the most is how it's passing by all these families and no one is paying any attention to it. The thing is, it didn't necessarily seem evil to me, just sad. It didn't make eye contact with me. It was just walking slowly and sadly through the park. This huge grey guy is dressed up as Frankenstein's monster, painted grey on this sunny day, and no one even took notice of him. I don't know what to make of it. A very short 10 second psychosis on my part, or something supernatural. I also wanted to share this with you to see if any other Aussies know any legends that resemble what I saw, or if anyone has had a similar experience, because I can't explain this strange humanoid and can't find anything similar regarding this encounter. I used to run bread for a big bread company and started at 3 a.m. I had to drive to a few remote stores in little towns surrounding mine. I was about halfway through the 50 mile drive to the next town. It was dark and there were no houses around for a long way in any direction. I look on the side of the road ahead of me and see a backhoe, which was odd in itself. Then I notice his bucket is super high. And as I'm getting closer, I realize he is gutting a cow that is hanging from the bucket. Now, I happen to have grown up around ranching, so I wasn't too freaked out. So for some reason, I decided to slow down and see if this guy needed help. I can't explain this decision. When I stop next to him, he just smiles and waves. So I do the same thing and ask, need a hand? He just cracks up laughing hysterical knee slapping laughter. For some reason, I start laughing too. And now we're two guys cracking up laughing, one covered in blood, and the other with a truck full of bread. The reality of the situation makes its way into my sleep deprived brain. And I hit the gas and get out of there. I thought about it and realized this guy drove a tractor into the middle of nowhere to kill someone else's cow he was probably poaching. And he was going to load the thing in the front bucket and drive that into his house at 3am. Who knows how far away he has to drive this thing. No idea what the hell was happening the whole time. And it's pretty creepy looking back. This was in late November of 2012. And I was doing an install in a winery in North Carolina. It was a long day because we were working out of town. So we worked late to get it finished in one day. I started driving home around midnight and had about a three hour drive back home to Oakland. It's 1.30 in the morning. I'm outside of Stockton and I see this girl standing on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. She's wearing a little white dress that ends about three inches above her knees and is barefoot. She has long black hair flowing down her shoulders and she is just standing still as a statue. I looked at her as I drove by, but she didn't move didn't acknowledge my loud truck as it passed or anything. I was pretty freaked out because you always hear stories like this. And then she just appears in your vehicle with you. But that wasn't the case. She just stood there in the night. The thing that was most weird to me was that it was cold that night in the low 40s, as well as drizzling a fair bit. And she was wearing a short dress and had no shoes standing on the asphalt. If this was just some girl who does this for fun to freak people out, I feel like she would have been extremely cold. 
and would have been shivering. But this girl did not move. Now, after I got home, I was thinking about it. And I searched Ghost Girl outside of Stockton. And I found a bunch of articles and stories about the East Eight Mile Road Ghost Girl. And most of the descriptions fit what I saw to a T. I never went back to the area because I moved to another state shortly after. But I want to travel back there to see what I can find one day. Has anyone else seen this girl in that area? Or has anyone else seen a ghost girl in general on the side of a road like this one? Any info would be appreciated. For starters, this is a story from my mother's side of the family from the early 1900s in rural eastern Ukraine told by my great-great-grandmother. When my great-great-grandmother was a teenager, she and some family friends went briefly traveling. I can't remember the why, but that's not relevant to this story. They traveled by horse at the time, so it would take quite a while, obviously requiring camping throughout the whole ordeal. One night, the traveling company laid a camp in a steep near a forest and stationed their horses right by the campsite. It was quite deep into the night, and when my great-great-grandmother was awoken by the wind noises and the rambling of horses, which were clearly unnerved by something, as being a village girl, she knew she had to check it out. And as she got out of the tent and walked towards the horses, among the low, steep vegetation, she noticed a figure. It was smaller than her, and was very hairy, with clear human traces. It was bipedal, kind of resembled an old man, and had very long hairy arms. The horses then calmed down, and it walked away. Growing up and listening to Slavic folk tales, this didn't strike me as spooky, but more as magic and mysterious, in a culturally occult kind of way, if you get what I'm saying. My grandfather spent some time researching about it, as most people from this side of the family have always had a lot of interest in paranormal phenomenon. Anyway, people said it was a leshi, a protective spirit of the woods, or perhaps a domolvoi, a protective spirit of the household. The latter doesn't seem convincing to me, as it was in the middle of nowhere. Basically, my guess is that it was a polvic. Now, in Slavic mythology, these are field spirits that appear as deformed dwarves with different color eyes and grass instead of hair. Any European folklore always has very particular vibes to me. It was mysterious yet blissful. How do you see these beings? Like literal nature creations, ancient humanoids, fey energy spirits? very strange. I live in Australia, so it gets quite hot even during the night, which leads us to leaving the windows open a fair bit for air. But every so often I will hear this kind of otherworldly purr from outside the window. It's like nothing I've ever heard before, but it's always very quiet, barely above a whisper. Once I had a friend stay at my house for the night, and the window next to my bed was open. We were playing a Pokemon Nuzlocke together, and then suddenly, there was a loud growl, but from an animal I'd never heard before. It scared the absolute crap out of both of us, and we went straight to bed. In the Christmas holidays, I went to see my family, and my sister was there, and I'd asked her if she'd ever heard anything similar, because my room used to be hers before she moved out. And she told me she used to hear weird growls and other noises outside her window at night. As of the time of writing this, I'm kind of freaking out. I've only heard this one time, but it was hot, and I opened my window about 10 minutes ago and heard it again. Am I looking too far into this? Or is this a strange animal? What do you guys think? Because I am decidedly unsure. 
About 15 years ago, my parents, my brother and I, were driving around the countryside looking for a way back to the highway, after going to see a house outside of the city. The vegetation is mostly tall grass and dead trees, and the dirt road isn't lit at all, which at night gives the surroundings a kind of eerie feeling. My dad's Nissan Primera it's making his way through the countless deserted crossroads. And we are lost as hell, because there was no GPS back then. As we are arriving at another crossroads, we see there's something in the middle of the road. It looks like a baby carriage. As we get closer, my father slows down on the side of the carriage, and my mother starts shouting. There in the middle of the road is a beat up baby carriage on its side. And we can hear a baby crying. My mum is going, my God, the baby, get the baby. And as she goes to open her door, my dad punches in gear and does one of those movie moves where the car slides a bit and does a gravel kick. He basically wants to haul ass out of there. My mother is still crying and screaming, her door half open, and my brother and I look back just in time to see four guys jump out the tall grass on the side of the road, holding planks and baseball bats and other weapons. We eventually find our way to the highway and stop at a gas station right at the entrance. My father tells the gas station attendant what we just saw, and the dude goes, Oh yeah, those guys. They're always doing that to steal cars and money. They basically put a baby doll in a carriage. And when you stop the car, they jump out the bushes and jack you for all you've got. We never went back to that region after that. I was driving to visit my sister, who lives in Missouri. It's late. And I admit I was a bit tired, but not bad enough where I should have pulled over to a hotel. I get to this stretch of road, where it's just cornfield on either side of me. I have directions to drive straight, and take the next left. I drive and drive and drive and drive. No lefts, but multiple rights. Now, every now and again, there might have been a left. But it's a small man made road that wasn't big enough for my car. I start getting a bit confused on where I was supposed to turn because I'd been driving straight for 45 minutes with still no turn in sight. I pass a left that was big enough for my car, but was a dirt road. And I figure how that's probably it. I take the next right and end up driving around a cornfield paved road maze. I ended up lost for about two hours before I finally found the small dirt road. I drive up to it and find myself at a house. This was obviously not the right left. So I threw it in reverse and went to leave. When I saw a light from my field of view. I look over and there's a large group of people over 10 standing around a fire coming my way. It was 3am. I was lost. I'd been driving in a maze for two hours, and I was tired. And it was enough for one night. So I drove off. I got lost again, and ended up driving about two hours in the wrong direction. Found a gas station, waited for morning, and rang my sister to help me find where the hell she lived. As you can tell, this was before cell phones and GPS became prevalent. When I traveled to India about 20 years ago, I took the bus to travel from one city to another. It was a night bus, so most of the people around me were sleeping. It was dark, and the roads were surrounded by forest out in the middle of nowhere. The road was only illuminated by the headlights of the bus, and we were seemingly alone on the road. I was bored, and passed the time by staring out the window. There I saw a creature on the side of the road, hurrying into the dark woods. The moment lasted no more than a second or two, but I saw the creature clearly. 
It looked like something with a human body doing an inverted crab walk. It had the head of a Doberman dog or jackal, and had a waddling gait, with each limb moving independently like an insect. Everyone around me was asleep, and I felt like I had gone insane. I kept telling myself, I must have caught a glimpse of something else and misinterpreted it in my mind. Because I caught a glimpse of it, and later years, I questioned whether I was dreaming it. I feel extremely certain of what I saw, but I'm probably wrong. There is probably a logical explanation to it. I'm a very rational person, and do not believe in supernatural things, but being in an Indian forest at night will make even the most sane person doubt their mind. Those forests are truly scary places. I was visiting family in the US when I was a kid. We were on a three hour drive in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. I had to take a leak really bad, and my dad eventually pulls the car over so that I could go in the woods. This was about at 11 o'clock in the morning. I went far off to the road into the woods because I didn't want anyone to see me. I wound up being completely out of sight of my family and the road itself. I started urinating next to this large rock, and notice up ahead that there were these three figures digging around in the dirt. At first, I was like, damn, these people will see me. So I continued to finish without urinating. And as I kept my eye on them, I noticed that they definitely weren't human. They seemed to be in suits, however, they also looked naked you could see they had genitals swinging between their legs. At this point, I ran and quietly slipped away from the rock and back to the road in my family's car. A few years later, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries, and there was an episode that had the classic grey type alien, and it looked exactly like the thing that I saw in the woods. I've had a few experiences. The first was driving to my friend's ranch for a New Year's Eve party. This was down in Eagles Pass, near the Texas-Mexico border. It was pouring rain and I was creeping down a back road with my high beams on. Something jumped in front of my truck, stopped for a second, and then darted back into the woods. It was about three feet tall, white, and briefly stood on two legs. I'm pretty sure Gollum lives in South Texas, and it freaked me the hell out. The second, an abandoned and torn up tent in the outback of Australia. On our road trip up the west coast, we took a little detour inland near Carnarvon to see the red sands and such. We went down a dirt road with nothing for miles, and we found a tent. We hesitantly approached it and saw that it had been torn open on the side. There was a filthy pillow and some scattered clothes inside, but it was still firmly stalked down. It looked like it had been there a while. The final one was back in Texas, out near Enchanted Rock, walking around the woods with some friends when they stumbled into a pit full of rattlesnakes. I don't know if you've ever seen a snake den, but they tend to ball up into a horrifying Lovecraftian nightmare. We live in New Jersey, and if you're familiar with the magazine Weird and Jay, then you'll know all about Clinton Road. For those of you who don't, Clinton Road is a road in West Milford, New Jersey, that's 10 miles of pure dark and winding of road in the middle of the woods with no street lights and no houses the entire way. It's considered the most haunted road in America and is a popular spot for teens and young adults to look for a scare. Popular urban legends of the area are ghosts, satanic rituals and KKK gatherings in the woods, hybrid animals, and a spot where mafia hitman Richard Iceman Kuklinski would dump his bodies. So my friend and I took a trip there one time, and he's driving down the road and he swears he saw a fat guy with his face covered in face paint or makeup 
in his underwear, walking on the side of the road. Another time he said he found a red phone booth just like the ones in Britain, if not an exact replica, with an ominous purple or dark blue light shining from it. <laughs>